Yeah. Now you might be sitting there thinking, well, it's subjective. There's no right or wrong answer. But I am willing to bet that you don't really believe when you say it's subjective, there's no right or wrong answer. Is that what subjective necessarily means? No, and I hate it when people do this. People will <laughs> do this say. with yeah. Vosh does this all the time. Someone will say, oh, it's arbitrary, it's arbitrary. There's a lot of arbitrary and subjective things. Just because something is subjective or just because something is arbitrary doesn't mean there's not a right or wrong answer. Most of the human experience is subjective, but we definitely have strong preferences for different answers within that subjective realm of things, right? Or like the human experience is subjective, but that doesn't mean that like any answer goes for anything else, right? Yeah. Believe yeah, they... That. It, and plus, when she says, is it sub subjective, to which thing is she asking that? Sure. Which part of that is supposed to be subjective? The fact that what the meaning actually is, what the intention was, what the takeaway was from other people, which part are you referring to well, as being the subjective part? This is the thing. When I saw the name of the video and I saw the length, I was like, no way you cracked this <laughs> in 38 minutes. No way. <laughs> No. There's a big difference between saying that the quality of an artwork is subjective and the meaning is subjective. If you don't like the portrait of Madame X, then fair enough. I guess I'm not to everyone's taste and that's- I actually think there's crossover with those two conversations in some ways, depending on if you can get two people to agree on what quality means in the same way, kind of, that if you can get them to agree, kind of like we, what we just did with meaning as best we could. If someone was to be able to do that, then you can start. Cause like, I don't know if you had the two forms of quality, like this is good from the perspective of craftsmanship and you define that specifically versus this is good because it make me feel good. Mm -hmm. Like you could have those two separated out. So yeah, you have to get really different. into the weeds on this. Like you, you can do this one argument about music. People are like, oh, music is subjective. I was like, sure. You can have intelligent conversations comparing piece of art. Like this might be a song that is way more, um, uh, not sophisticated, but complex than this song, which is far more simple. That doesn't make it good or bad, but this song uses more instruments versus this song. This song is louder or has a greater range of whatever. Like there are objectively true statements you can make about art itself, even if the ultimate perception or enjoyment of it is, is somewhat subjective, right? Right. Suppose when I pose for it, it's more like the portrait of Madame XY, but is it really the case that I can be about anything? If somebody says to you, I just saw Doctor Strange 2, and you go, oh yeah, what's it about? And they say, it's about how love has an everlasting value, even between two people of different social classes on a doomed ocean liner. So funnily enough, with that example, I was thinking, you kind of screwed yourself over because you said what it's about, which isn't necessarily what it means, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, something, so when you say that something is about something, you're making a much more direct appeal to the thing itself. Or an is claim, content. right? Yeah, Descriptively, it is almost, yeah. about this. It sounds yeah, like, 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 like you could describe the plot or the, the characters in it, yeah, at least like when we're said, referring to a movie. Like, what is, what is, um, like, Indiana Jones about? It's like, well, it's about what happens in the story, I guess, would be, like, yeah, the clearest. Yeah, it is not about a tortoise eating it. strawberry jam. Yeah, there are correct in that, answers with that well, one. Yeah, you can be correct and incorrect. If you're like, Indiana Jones stars Peter Parker, also known as Spider-Man, like oh wait whoops like you've gotten your references wrong like what you've just said is just not true yeah like pretty categorically and like any claims that you make based on that it's kind of like what it's about is like what you need to agree on first before you can even start to talk about what it means or like how good well or bad it yeah is. although again um god fuck somebody turned me out of this and i just realized there's so, so many hard questions are actually just like poorly phrased questions when you ask what is something about mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by about are you asking yeah. like for very fundamental descriptive facts or do you mean like what is the overall theme or meaning like that question requires expansion because it's the same. yeah i think it was um the same for like when she said what what does it mean versus what it's what is its quality mm -hmm. like i feel like those questions have a lot of overlap if you're not very clear on what exactly you mean by meaning yeah <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> yeah there's really first question which would be what is meaning <laughs> that's probably what exactly. or what is art you got to get those out of the way what is art and what is meaning and once we See, figure those out we can agree we can move on from there we yeah. only took what half an hour you know you can do it yeah. sort of because yeah. i like i make fun of like philosophers for legitimately just having dog shit writing skills because i think a lot of them do write poorly uh, but like part of the reason for that is because you have to be when you're defining terms you have to be so 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 careful because mm. it's so easy to like not be ultra crystal crystal clear in what you're saying that you get like lost in this kind of dumb shit yeah you'd be like no that's titanic it definitely that could be titanic mm -hmm. Um, 
I suppose, yeah. right? Probably, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, you've, already, uh, you've already assigned it to the thing. You could be wrong. They could be. They could be a completely different thing. The other disaster uh, ship film was Poseidon, right? Did anyone ever yeah. see those ones? Yeah, I terrible. saw the original. I haven't. There's probably I saw a romance the on that. I haven't seen a remake. Poseidon was part of the era that I dislike, where there was no consideration for people who were secondary characters. If you were secondary, nobody cared what happened to you. It, it's Aww. Gordon. Like, Poseidon had a lot of Gordons. I remember that. Have a, are people just suffering and knowing the story doesn't care about them, sort of thing. Yeah, nobody cares. They just move on. It's like, well, our main characters are cool, so who cares about this guy who helped you, who helped you escape, and then you just let oh, him Oh, by the way, you know my version of your, um... Fuck, I've already forgotten the name. My brain refuses to remember the name. Gordon, you said, right? Yeah, Gordon from... Yeah, fuck. My, my Gordon is the one from Jurassic Park Lost World. Right? I've told yeah. you about him before. I will never forgive the film for that. He, that actor, I found out today, he's the voice of Odin in Ragnarok, where he's going to be really? in God of War Ragnarok. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> what are the odds? Cool. Okay. Oh. Feels coincidental, probably isn't, but yeah. Seems like you can look at a work of art, think you know what it's about, and be wrong. Which means the meaning, at least, is not subjective. Well, wh That's wait. Not, that is a different thing. Yeah, just uh, because you can be wrong about something doesn't mean that it's not subjective, right? Well, yeah, because you could be wrong, but there could be plenty of like arguments that somebody could make for totally different conclusions about what it means. Just because you got it wrong doesn't mean that there's like a absolute set yeah, rigid one answer to the question of what it means. It's almost like there's a broad spectrum of what you could do say is what you got from it but it's still in a box as in there are still limitations on the totality of yeah. the things you can say because uh, you, you can't just go out right. like so far outside there's nothing to support it at all we've talked, about the, uh, the, we've talked about colors right maybe it's like that there is the color spectrum and there is the visible color spectrum which is like the boundary for i guess correctness vaguely and once you get too far away from like what is in the story where, like, all of your references to what happens and who the characters are, yeah. what they say to each other is so wrong that, like, it basically becomes impossible for you to slot into the correct conclusions, the many correct, or, or like, you know, varying correct claims you can make about a story. Mm -hmm. What's funny about that is that you could have a couple of people be like, so Doctor Strange 2 was about love transcending the multiverse, and someone else be like, no, 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 it was about trying to escape the worst version of yourself. That, like, that's what life is. And someone else goes, well, no. It's about that you should never think of, like, the best vision of your life in some of the multiverse. You should always think about what you have and how thankful you should be for it. And all three of those would be correct, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's fair. Either. It could, it could yeah. be about all of them. It's not like this is a like a dichotomous yeah. proposition where it has to be one thing or the other. But if you say that Interstellar then... is, like, about, like, the relationship between, like... Um like friends in school and like a feeling of like loss and moving on when you like move from high school to college or big stages in life, it's going to be pretty hard to defend that one for yeah, Stella. Like, right? What are you referencing with that? Like, yeah. It's a hard it's to defend difficult. Movie, yeah. yeah. So just because you can be wrong about something does not imply that a thing, um, I feel yeah. like you could probably express this with really basic like prop logic. I, she's, I hate this person. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> well the, What's what's baked in? Like we don't even say it because it's so baked into it. But when someone says what this art means, it's generally they're, they're saying to me. Um, like well, when generally. we say is a is a like is a certain I don't know our that is is our vegetables good? Like, yeah, for for humans generally, yeah, they are. You know, it, it's got that assumption that's kind of built into the statement that you're making. But since meaning is pulled from a thing based on individuals, you have to you have to add more to that statement for me to know. Sure. We're also almost entering the language problem again there as well because of uh it's like when when you guys were talking about about it's like my brain immediately went to what what happens in the film meanwhile plenty of people will be like as destiny said they'll go to what the theme was or something like that so you have to be more clear because i actually think like if i was to guess what do you think the majority responds to when you say what is a film about do you think people would more likely go for theme or they would more likely go for a, a plot summary it's. I think they'd I go think, for a plot. I don't know. Yeah, I think Probably. most people would go for. It'd be like 80 20. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think, think so. 
or maybe so the there might be some movies where people there might be some movies where people predominantly would talk about theme but there's probably the exceptions mm. yeah no i think and it depends on kind of what circles you're running in right i think that if philosophy two were talking to like h bomber guy and asked what a film is about uh -huh. they're almost exclusively only ever talking about themes Pro oh yeah probably depends on where you're introduced to it as well like if you were to ask people what is 1984 about nobody's probably actually i don't even know how many people read the book but nobody's going to give you a plot summary they're going to say mm -hmm. 1984 is about big brother or something right. like it depends on what the story is if it's like some really culturally important story um that like has spun off into well maybe not spun off it's just like yeah like so culturally significant in terms of how it informs people's perceptions about a bunch of things in the world maybe it like yeah at that point people are just going to gravitate to its impact more so than what even happened in the story yeah maybe yeah. i wonder it's if just... you take uh, 1984 is a good example because I wonder if the people who haven't read it and the people who have read it would give one would focus on the plot and the other would focus on like the message more uh -huh. I, I think because um, a lot of people so... they don't know the plot most people haven't read that book uh -huh. I bet a lot of people have heard of the book and they know the general concept of what it's trying to say so that's what they would go to because they don't even know the plot at yeah. all the meaning at least is not subjective so assuming artworks do have objective meaning that is a we, leap that is <laughs> we are we are Wait, not fuck. two minutes in i was gonna say i don't know how we got here already i'll play it again the Just... meaning at least is not subjective so assuming artworks do have objective meaning it's just it's such a like oh okay I feel like we skipped the video there because I, um, I think she, she's gotten this from how you can say someone is wrong about what a film is about, therefore there must be objective. And it's like, oh, I feel like we've, there's so many steps we didn't well, do there. But one, one, yeah. one minute and 39 seconds in, we have the conclusion. Art is objectively, has an objective meaning. To be fair, she, she's phrased it as a question. Because, uh, yeah, of course, I don't believe Abigail Thorne would say art or meaning is objective. Uh, well, but she's maybe. presenting. I'd hope not. <laughs> How do we find out what the meaning is? If I don't get it, how do I get it? All right then. Okay. If you enjoyed today's episode and you want to help me make more free educational material, <laughs> educational, oh, come on. Uh, consider <laughs> signing up material. at patreon.com slash philosophy tube and pledging a couple of dollars a month to keep the show going. Why can't I just donate one? Oh. Very oh, rare, Stefan Molyneux reference. Too. I appreciate it. Wait, was that, that a Stefan? Oh, is that a Stefan Molyneux reference? Oh fuck, never mind. I thought it was. Oh look, there we go. We got intar intention versus subject. Uh, uh -oh. Oh, oh my <laughs> god, we did it! Right there. Oh my god. Oh god. These paintings are some of the most famous examples of modern art in the world, and I have are absolutely you digitally... no idea what they mean. Is she doing something with her voice here? To make what, it sound like she's in a big open room, echoey right? space. Careful. Yeah, but she's always like echoing. whispering and everything. They should probably added reverb in post, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Now, how? You know what? What do we think the meaning of these paintings okay. are? Okay. Because, well, we've both got we got the same origin story, I'm pretty sure. We both tell every once in a while. This yeah. uh, convinced me that art is shit and it should all be torn down. My, my was, origin story is I went to an art gallery and it was like for a school trip and they brought us to like. I, I, it was either a blank canvas or it was just red, uh, like the example that we had. And we had to sit there and try to talk about what it meant. And I was just sitting there and I had no idea what I was supposed to say or make of any of this. Based. Well, that's, it's yeah, a, we're gonna. You walk in and you're like, did we need a whole room for this? <laughs> well, well, she'll explain what these ones are, but I. I was going to say, my one, um, it, th at this point, because I used to tell it as sort of just like a funny story, but I'm starting to think it was like fucking formative for me. It was, because uh, it, was, it was early on in school years, and we went to the Tate Modern in, um, in London as a school trip thing. And yeah, there was a room filled with, it was similar to this. It was splashes, big red splashes onto loads of these huge canvases. And um, the two teachers that had taken us went immediately left, and I was like, wait, 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 like, what, what's, what, what am I supposed to do with all this? And he was just like, you look at it, and then you think about stuff, I guess. And I was just like, <laughs> He's my new so, favorite person. Yeah, and this is the thing, I, uh, I ended up, like, I did look at each of them, but I was just like, mm. and then I tried to find out where he was, and he'd gone up to, like, uh, Renaissance paintings and stuff, and I was just like, oh shit, these look amazing. Like, and I was staring at them for no, ages. Fuck you know? the red spots, man, I'm looking at this Hieronymus Bosch 
And then we had, um, we got these little, like, papers at the end where it's just, like, describe your feelings about these papers. And I was like, it's a big red splash. They're like, that's what it is. That's not how you felt. And I was like, I, I don't... I felt like it was a big red splash. <laughs> Alright, leave me alone now, please. Yeah, Go please away. leave me alone. This is like, um, because... I called in sick. It's not just that, um... Because I know that anyone out there would be like, oh, you can't just... Like, like, how stifled are you? Just look at it. And just try to feel. And I'd be like, yeah, but it's, it's not even just that. It's the whatever I am feeling, I don't even know that the paintings earned it. You know? It's it's more so... It's done to evoke feelings rather than me doing all the legwork on their behalf. Well, rather than yeah. what my day has been so far, who I'm with, how I right. am, and how hungry I am, how tired I am, what I what I was thinking about just now, what did I watch last night? Like, Maybe that's the point. Yeah. That's the, the point, yeah. <laughs> is yeah, it cause... really a good painting <laughs> if I could do it? Well, I, I, so that's where we get into a, a complicated discussion as well. How much of, like, what we talk about when it comes to art and its meaning should stem from, I guess, like, is art like a skill? I was expression paired with skill? Um, well, I, I, was, I was just joking, art. but um, I guess, I mean, I wouldn't not call these red fucking boxes no, on the wall. I wouldn't call them art. Yeah, uh, sorry, I wouldn't not call them art. Sorry, right. it, it is art. It's just boring art that I have no interest in. <laughs> well, I think... I'm very tempted to call it shitty, but it, I probably oh, wouldn't man. if we were in conversations that were incredibly like specific and detailed. And the the irony there is that I think oh, most I people in the world, say if the artist was in the room, you wouldn't call it. That. Um, yeah, that's probably <laughs> I true. Would. I'd be like, oh, this is great, man. This I would, I would, I would do it just to get them to defend you know, this. What I'd I would like, like to is see shit, is, mate. I'd want to see the creation of them, and if it's as simple as I imagine it is, Based. that would be interesting to see. They're called the Seagram. Destiny, what are what are these? Look at that! Come on! Oh, fuck off! When you look at this, what does it mean to you? I need to know. Um, right now it just looks fucking stupid. It would depend on how contemplative of a mood I was in, you know. By the way, this is a meme format for sure. Just saying. <laughs> absolutely. The framing is pretty perfect. Yeah. Hold on, I'll be back one second. All right, mm -hmm. you, the, good, the good thing there's a security camera there, so someone doesn't fuck up the red box. Yeah. Well, I mean, they've, they've even got the line there. To make sure that you don't go. Mess yeah, don't with get it. close to <laughs> the don't red. ruin the red. Box. It, will, I, it, it is know. an endless it's, void. It's, it will swallow you. Do not touch. I don't thing. know. Like when you go to an art gallery, I don't know. I'm just like when I look at these amazing like paintings that were painted like 500 years ago with way fewer like access to the resources that are available now to paint something similar, and yeah. I see this. Like, if all of us were told to stand in front of it and just 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 experience it, I would probably start giggling because I just feel like I would start making like shit up. Only humans are fucking capable oh, of convincing yes, the themselves. Jews, they this is like a super meaningful thing to do. Of the artist as they drew this picture, it's a in it, they, they are there is a tempest inside the artist. Uh, the red well, maybe the anger. I guess, that, mm. Well, you know what? Why don't we actually try like? <laughs> For real, to uh, to figure uh, out. We can. It's uh, supposed right to represent out. the vast nothingness of pain. It right, represents. Well, they... Okay. The, it the vast... represents that mm. they the the artist was very upset and angsty, but it's not a bright. It's red, but it's Man, not bright red. So they're not like. Like I, need I know, all right? You could Somebody fit else like could have ten good things there, in there, but you need all this space for your one. Yeah, look at them hogging up all that real estate. Yep. Oh, but, but imagine you were the artist that like did this incredibly detailed, like super long landscape with an enormous and beautiful just just portion of it's earth. It's huge. Life, you and you know. both submit and this one is like number one at the gallery, yours is number two. You're like, okay. Mm. <laughs> That's fine. Right. That's guess, fine. That's you fine. Gotta, yeah, you yeah, gotta yeah. take it on the chin, you know? Yeah, you do, because that's just the reality of but also, art. like Cause, what does it mean? This is, this is a room filled with painting like this. You can see the one behind her just off on the right. And then there were other ones as well on the walls. It's a whole room filled with paintings like this. Maybe it's that's how I would, would rationalize my experience here. I'd be like, I'm going to rate them in terms of funniness. This one is number one. There's nothing beating it. <laughs> it's great. This is a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is this painting comedy? It's, but I mean, I guess that's the thing, though. How much does it factor into the meaning of this art if I said that to the artist and they disagreed with me? They're like, it's not meant to be funny. It's like, well, like it or not. Uh, <laughs> well, got a good chuckle out of me. I, I'd imagine... 
anyone who's drawing shit like this, this red pill, or rather, then. anyone who's painting shit like this, should surely be on team. You can interpret it as you wish, you know. You would think so, because otherwise, could you imagine having like a rigid meaning? Because there's so little to pull from it that you like. What can you pull from it as its like core meaning? I guess what. <laughs> This sucks. I'm trying to be as good get faith as possible. It's like, what can you pull I'm from not. that? And it's like, <laughs> well, look, at least try we're supposed right. to be whoever, right. drew, whoever yeah. drew this is an asshole. Hey, look, all right, maybe maybe there is something here that I'm not seeing. Maybe you it's know? maybe it's hung on the wall the wrong here. way. The painting's on the back. They they put it on backwards. Oh, the real painting's on the other that. side. What what if like? Could you imagine if, if, if like, they flipped it upside down in a, a new exhibition and everyone's like, oh, this changes every... Sit right, so... <laughs> this like, change, like, that's, a, that's like a skit for a Monty well, Python. Well, it is kind of a skit because it's kind of, that's kind of how I feel about this, like, in terms of trying to have a conversation. It feels like we're performing, we're LARPing, like, we're doing mm -hmm. a little play where we're sort of, like, pretending that we understand what this means, when in reality we all kind of recognize it's just a big red canvas. That's all we're looking at. You mentioned how but big it was. Like, it's literally too big to flip it into portrait orientation. In this you room, fit it's too it. big. Yeah. Destroy the roof or destroy the canvas. It I would guess. just it goes straight through the roof as they turned it. Its I sheer artistic presence would cut through oh, the well, I guess, No, I guess you wait. No, we're being stupid. You could just put it on its flat and then spin it around it, and, uh, on the okay. floor. It, Let's just put it on the floor and pretend it's a bags. rug so people can walk all over it. I think it's people a very full for that. That would become its own art piece. See, this it is would. how firm the pain is. Ooh, yeah. Do it's, you guys um, uh, yeah. know about like interactive, interactive art? Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to say because yeah. like the the sort of motion of everyone walking across it eventually makes it interesting to look at. Which I'm not even. I actually would defend that that's versus an this experiment <laughs> for sure. Yeah, that's an interesting experiment. Uh, but yeah, no. To, to what you were just saying, Frank, it does feel like uh, that's what humanity did eventually. This is the lowest common denominator where we tricked ourselves into sort of everyone is telling each other that this is very meaningful, right? Right? And everyone's just sort of you want to get inside everyone's heads, and uh, no, they perceive the color, they conclude that's all that's there. But now I'm just going to go into deep thought, like you're in a deprivation tank sort of thing, and you just start thinking about stuff, and then you apply whatever that is to this, like this did it. Well, that, I guess because yeah, it's in front of you. Works. I guess that's where it starts to what what do we say about like the meaning of art in terms of what it evokes from you to if if like we start to consider you know how are you feeling before you showed up today what's on your mind at the moment um and you mentioned it before like even even if we got like what did you eat for breakfast like how many of these things will filter into the way that you perceive it and if so how much of that should be attributable to the art itself rather than just that's the right. natural experience of life that's why I kind of appreciate that we got this one specifically because I actually, even with the simpler, you know, if it was like a stick man with a smiley face, I would, I would actually probably defend that quite a bit compared to this, because I'd be like, I probably would, too. yeah. There may be a lot of dimensions to be able to draw from it, but this is about as simple as this. Is this? I the know what a stick person get? generally represents. That's already a huge step forward. If it was a white we'll canvas, would be absolute zero, right? Or at least close well, to... Well, it would be better if it was a white canvas, because there would be the opportunity to, for someone to paint over it in, like, an actual piece of art, you know? Well, you could... I mean, it's, in a way, it's like, this is 333 by John Cage in art form, almost, right? What? I know I know what? that song. I, I know that quote-unquote song. There's a there's oh, a yeah, song that a guy called John Cage makes where you just, you sit in a auditorium being silent for three minutes and 33 seconds. I think the piano player sits down, he lifts the... Um, oh, it, yeah, yeah, he just sits there and the ex yeah. or it might be four minutes and 33 seconds. I don't remember. But um, you see he lifts it. He sits there. You wait. And then he closes the piano to let you know that the song is done. And the song is the experience that you have sitting there listening to everybody around you. Right. That would be the equivalent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, guess. I remember I remember in grade school they did that. And it was like, we're going to listen to the song. And I was just sitting there in my chair like this. Sucks. You think about video games. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That, I was be... thinking about anything else. That can be interesting for sure, and there's something to be spoken about there. Um, I guess I I wonder like when we wh how, what do we compare for what four thirty three to I don't know like Moonlight Sonata or some like or uh, just any any number of uh, songs in terms of comparing like what they're trying to offer you. It seems like they they're so different that um. It'd be hard to compare them, you know. Like, how do you compare this to like some elaborate baroque painting? 
what kind of comparison could you ever make in terms of like how they try to evoke meaning from somebody when one of them has things that are much more readily identifiable and easy to latch onto compared to you know this where like you're doing so much of the work uh-huh. and um <clears throat> i brought it up before but I, I just can't resist saying it that in uh i think it was venice my memory's falling apart at this point there was a series of rooms and then in the corner there was a fire extinguisher and people were standing looking at it and it was not a piece but it is in the place it is to be viewed so it because that's going to bring us back to the whole definitions thing right because to all the people viewing it they're like of course this is an art piece but then uh it would just be like well i wonder if it would change their mind if they found out it was just a fire extinguisher but there for the utility of extinguishing fires in emergencies i don't know like it because they would, they would I mean, when you say the, when you say something like that that in and of itself is an interesting question right yeah this is the this is the thing it's funny but simultaneously it's like the fact that it's getting everyone to perceive differently because they believe it is here to be uh, yeah, an influence into your perception beyond just being a fire extinguisher. Yeah, it's like, that's kind of like that you've entered into this place and by being in this place, like an art gallery, it's just changed the way that you're going to view everything that you see in here. Because yeah. you know where you are and you know what that means compared to if you're just out in the open. Like if well, that's why I was, I was saying I feel like this has pushed it to the absolute limit. And, uh, yes. I suppose, fine. Because the other thing, you know, if, if, if thousands of people enjoy this, I'm like, yeah, okay, fine, go for it. Sure. Well, I guess we're going to find out what Abigail uh, thinks about yeah. this particular painting. They were painted in the 1950s by American artist Mark Rothko. Originally, he was commissioned to make them for an upscale That looks like the, the uh, pause, <laughs> the EFAP logo. That is inspired by us, for sure. In New yeah. York. But when he actually visited the place, he changed his mind and gave the money back. The paintings are still displayed in accordance with his intentions. Close to the ground. Yeah, you shouldn't have been paid. Yeah, fuck you. Ooh, <laughs> you're being too mean. I know, if, I'm being mean. I'm you know how it works. If people want to pay for it, they'll pay for it. Is, yeah. Which, that's their own decision to make, okay? Yeah, that's <laughs> right? Fun. You're American. We're, having, we're having fun here. We're, having, we're just having in fun a small with these room squares. With off-white walls in low, even lighting. Rothko said... He wanted audiences to feel trapped. Which is funny okay. because the first thing that came to my mind seeing this one was window. Oh, Which, I was like, thinking about the number zero. I was just thinking about the number zero. And isn't that yeah. interesting? It is. I, to be fair, At I least think this, this one has a fucking shape on it. I was going to say, this one's more interesting than the other one. I, I'm just saying. It is. Yeah, it's objectively, one, objectively more interesting. Oh, yeah. I don't think you can say that. I just did Fringy. Objectively. I know you just did Fringy. Get fucked. Okay. Get wrecked. Defeated. Yeah. Wow. Art hater. If I want to get it, maybe those facts are a clue. If somebody tells me Rothko... When you say get it, do you mean understand what the artist meant by I it? Or so. what they were yeah. trying to say? Or how I, you I, should I, interpret I, it? Right. How well you should interpret it? I think she means the artist's intentions, I think. Because okay. she, she just set it up with the whole, like, feel trapped thing. Those okay. paintings are about being happy and having a nice time at the beach. I can point to his intentions and go, no, you're wrong. Because I don't want to get it wait, wrong. What? I'm sorry. Did we skip? Can we, can we hear that again? I think we, did we skip? If I want to get it, maybe those facts are a clue. If somebody tells me Rothko's paintings are about being happy and having a nice time at the beach, I can point to his intentions and go, no, you're wrong. Because I don't... Oh, you, oh. Could, you could say you were wrong about his intentions. Like, yeah, you're wrong hard. about his intentions. You're not wrong about what it means to me. I don't want to get it wrong. I don't want to misinterpret something. That could be really awkward. Like when your friend who you care. thought was straight sends you a bunch of flirty messages and you're like... Babe, is there something you need to tell me? And she goes, what? No, I'm definitely straight. Definitely interested in men. Everybody sends messages like that, right? This is hilarious. Why? Oh, no. Some okay. This is really like funny. Just, I don't know. I think really it was a funny. joke. I, I don't even, I'm not even sure. Well, yeah, you can tell the it's a joke because of how funny it was. is part of it. Albeit not a part that you can see with your eyes. Take, for instance, Fountain, one of the most famous. I was taught about this in school. 
I'm assuming you guys know about this, right? The I toilet. do not know about Fountain. <laughs> okay, I'll let her explain. Works of art. It is a ever. urinal. It was presented in 1917 by Marcel Duchamp, and it's what's called a ready-made. A sculpture that was already made, because it's just an ordinary urinal. He bought it from a shop. To the eyes, Did you say urinal or urinal? Urinal. Urinal. I can never tell when like I, British people are like kind of memeing and making words sound well, intentionally stupid yeah, versus just how they actually yeah. say it. Well, like, what do you, yeah, but, I'm the yeah, British that just said you. Wait, you guys say urinal? No, I, I said it as a joke, but apparently, urinal. urinal is how it's. it's uh, that's philosophy how. Too, I, philosophy tube is British, but I'm also British, and I say urinal. Wait, I thought you were fucking Australian. Are you really British? What? Pringy is the Australian. Pringy is the Australian. I am the Wait, American. Where the fuck is Mauler from? Can my chat tell me? I don't know if I'm getting trolled now. He's from. What? Uh, what? <laughs> what do you mean? What have they told you? <laughs> well, I thought you were fucking Australian. Am I wrong? He's Welsh? Yeah, Wales? That's very... How do I sound Australian? I don't know, at all? dude. You, you all sound offended. the fucking same to me. Jesus Christ. Wow. Okay, what a what does that even do? <laughs> fucking white wow. people. <laughs> You're always messaging me like fucking like 6 a.m. and shit. I figure, oh, this guy's Australian. He's up at the weirdest fucking hours of the day. He must be Australian. But okay. I just don't sleep. Yeah, clearly. Jesus. Sleep Australians can't sleep or else they'll get mauled by wild beasts. It's kind of true. Like, huh? That's true. That they sleep true. with one eye open um, like fish or sharks or something. Yeah, out of curiosity, Rags, does this uh, create a monkey wrench feel definitely? Like if someone just grabs a thing and then says, this is my art and puts it down? How I does that thought, like? I thought about that a little bit, um, but I'm not... I, I'm not sure. I suppose that the placement and the, the things they say about it are part of the expression of using it as art. I don't know, though. It's um, pushing it, right? It's pushing it? it, <laughs> it it's, it's, the, we, I think we can all agree this is pushing it. Um, but, yeah, I don't know how I feel. Like, if, if they if they did this and put it in a thing and said, this is art, I'm like, yeah. I still remember uh, when they told us about this, the whole class thought they were trolling. Like, our teacher. She was like, they just took a toilet and said it was art, and we were just like, <laughs> and she's like, no, 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 that happened. That was a thing. And it's like, why? I mean, is it? It could be if the person who made the toilet really wanted to have the slopes and curves of the urinal. To... Well, no, no, wait, hold on. This was trolling. That's what this art piece is, right? It was to challenge the, I believe, the perception of what is art. The thing is, is it a... That's an expression. <laughs> I was about to get into intention funny. versus no. meeting, I guess. Because I was like, is it a troll if it is only perceived as... Well, if it is accepted. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, is, is a troll based only on it? Because people were saying that those red images trolling. And it's like, as far as well, we I was tell, just saying that this guy intentionally, the goal of this was to be a challenging piece. To challenge you and what your perceptions of art were. That was the goal of the artist, I believe, for this. Sure. Uh, but I guess it... Because it didn't really, did it do its job if it like only just proved that it still counts? Well, yeah, that's yeah. The job was just to challenge to, someone and they succeed. It was to be thought provoking. Sense. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. So. Okay, yeah. We've thought a little bit about yeah, it. Yeah, we're thinking this right now normal. about it, aren't you? Yeah, this I guess I am. Cool. I still find it funny. Well, yeah, that's part of what your posting's all about. It's <laughs> trolling is, to be funny a little bit, right? Pissed. Fountain is identical to other urinals that are not art. So the argument goes. What makes it's the it the opposite different? of a fountain, isn't it? Because generally fountains produce like a liquid and spurt it out, but actually generally you, you pee into a ur urinal urinal. So it's like an inverse fountain. It is a receptacle. What was the name of this the fountain? Fountain, yeah. Oh, okay. oh, I guess it's so like even the name of it have been spawned about what it means for something to be art. There you go. That's oh, I thought it was like that. ironic. I, I like this is a year and I caught it objectively. I figured. I it don't out. know. I think that calling it a fountain was part of the intention to challenge it by naming it something that's like the inverse of. Matt, I feel like you just a uh, really good uh, example uh, of the opposite troll of this, of doing the exact opposite of what this particular piece is doing. Is um, this is shit? This is just posting a fucking toilet in a museum and, and challenging like, well, is it art because it's in a fucking museum? Um, and an opposite example, an opposite. An opposite example of this was a world famous, world class violinist went and he played um, solos in a New York subway for a while, and nobody stopped to care, nobody stopped to listen. This guy charges thousands of dollars um, when he does performances with orchestras and shit, but outside of a concert Damn. hall, nobody really seemed to give a fuck. Nobody stopped. A couple people stopped, and I think threw him a couple dollars, but really nobody gave a fuck. Um, and that's part of the. That's it's like the opposite example of this. Like, oh, so I guess it's only art when it's in a concert hall. You know. Location, location, location. Yeah is its meaning. If you don't get that meaning, 
you have, in a sense, failed to experience the artwork that uh, is Fountain. You've uh, just seen Eurynal. Funnily enough, uh, no, that... I just that's that's those oh. are not the same. I I can fail to see the original intention of the artist, but I can come up with a or I it could have a particular meaning to me. I wouldn't. I don't know if I'd call that a failure overall. A failure I, I only guess. a very specific element of the viewing. Why does you just see a urinal? Why is that like bad, wrong, worse, you know? or bad, or worse? Yeah. Why is it worse? Yeah. Why is it worse? Assuming you're drawing that from it? having described it as failure as opposed to just different meaning. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, hold on. Wait. At, wait. Play that part again. Let's. All cons right. Well, shit. Hang on to other urinals that are not art. So the argument goes, what makes it different is its meaning. If you don't get that meaning, you have in a sense failed to experience the artwork that is Fountain. You've just seen a urinal. Funnily enough. Like, yeah, I, I, I might have failed to have that particular specific experience, but I had my own experience. If that's so, the point being made by I philosophy, have, then I guess it counts. Yeah, it's just strange to put it that way, I think. Yeah. This whole discussion about the fountain thing. I mean, that that was our experience. That was fun. That was really fun. We enjoyed that. Had a great time. I have some artwork with me today that is about this very question. Oh, my God. Interpreting art, not whether your friend is flirting with you. Although, actually, kind of both. About that. This is Pale Fire by Vladimir Nabokov. One of the most famous novels of the 20th century. The story. I've never heard of it. Damn, I've never heard of it. Yeah, <laughs> I've never heard of it. But that could just be. I wonder. I, I yeah. I wonder if it's real. I don't know. That's I just. I don't, I don't know. I guess I'm not into well versed in Russian literature. Just not very well read. That's my ex. Yeah. That the poet John Shade has been murdered on the night that he completed his greatest work. So the poem has been published posthumously by his good friend Charles, with notes explaining its meaning. But as we read on, Charles's notes get weirder and weirder? He starts claiming that certain words in the poem are really a coded message. She is describing what the book is about. Huh. Uh, yeah, a summary of what actually takes place as opposed to what it necessarily means. But maybe she's getting to the meaning part in a sec. Maybe. maybe. Poem are really a coded message about how John was in love with him, but his wife wouldn't let him say it. And really, the poem is all about Charles until he's talking about things that are completely unconnected. And we're like, hang on a minute. Did he murder John? A lot of the humor comes from the fact that Charles is interpreting... Spoiler alert. I guess potentially spoilers. I don't know of the poem is wrong. He says it's about one thing, it obviously isn't, and that's why it's funny. But how do we know he's wrong? Well, it would be very helpful if we could just ask John what his poem is about. And that indeed, doesn't so necessarily answer the question. You'd assuming have to we'll assume get there. Being, yeah. Of being like, we've got to have like a basic understanding of what actually the words mean. I don't know, like... It, that is kind of the basis for how we decide if someone's right or wrong about any particular interpretation of a piece of artwork, right? It's just like, you're not being reasonable with what is there, at least with how we understand language to work. Uh, I don't know. I guess the funny thing about that is what if a simultaneous human civilization developed that just had a completely different set of parameters for everything, and then they both, they watch a film while we watch a film, and then... I don't know if that... Does that make sense? Would they come to different conclusions, or would it just be different ways to describe the same conclusions? Assuming they could, uh, is this assuming they could understand it, but all of their, like, symbolism and th stuff is different than ours? I just... If we were to duplicate uh, Earth right before, I don't know, advanced humans came along, and, uh, I don't know, move everyone around a bit, shake things up, and then just let them both progress, I imagine they'd have different languages, different, pretty much everything, right, butterfly style, and then the take a human yeah. from both of those planets, make them watch the movie, they're going to... <laughs> I was just trying to think, would it be fair to say that, uh, uh, that whatever they come up with, both of them, you could still bridge the gap between them because they're probably still going to have to adhere to whatever is actually present in the film. It doesn't really um, matter that... Probably, and plus the fact that they are the same species will probably give them links to the way that they perceive reality uh, at, uh, at a more basic level. Cause and effect? Yeah. Well, maybe. I think we'd have to be careful. Yeah, like, we like perceive that. music like, differently across our same planets, like the exact same planet, right? Like... 
So if things yeah, were totally yeah, I mean, different, it yeah. might be totally who knows, right? But in, in terms of stuff like cause and effect and this thing happens to another and be, being able to have a perception of what's actually being done and, you know, elements of just human psychology and, you know, the, the very, very intrinsic things that are that humans have, that would probably create some connections that they'd be able to both come away from it. But I don't know what those might necessarily be. But I imagine there'd be some. Maybe. 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 Maybe said the way you find out an artwork's meaning is you look at the artist's intention if it seems like your friend is flirting with you but it's kind of ambiguous just ask her how she feels but it doesn't really help us with pale fire well that's not a really good example because if they're being really ambiguous and you ask them a very direct question then they might be very evasive and they might lie to you on purpose that's you even further so, away from the truth yeah, that gets you further from the truth. You can't. Or, you know, death just... of the author, the person who's. I imagine an author just go from probably like a lie about the meaning of their art, though, right? Yeah, in in that sense, it. But that would be like that would be the example to use, not the one that sure. she used as an example of it. Seems. Well, yeah, because you do you do relationship advice, right? If uh, I do, absolutely. if you ask, yeah. I meant destiny, but sure, you do. I'm Get like the, Hitch, the zoo, man. right? Uh, yeah, if you think someone might be interested in you, or that it's like heavy implications from all the things that you can see but then you ask them and they're just like no not really be like that could mean a hell of a lot of things yeah it could mean because the whole setup is that john shade has been murdered we don't know what he intended maybe charles is right and the poem really is about him and this problem comes up a lot in art history we have evidence of what artists like rothko and duchamp intended for their works but often that isn't the case, especially if the art is very old. And even if we could go back and reconstruct an artist's intention. Right, is that square on the wall distracting anybody else? Because it's distracting me. I don't no. know, maybe I... <laughs> uh, all right, that's fine, that's fine. It's just, it's, it's just distracting me, that square on the wall. It's fine. It we might not be a very though, secure no foundation on which to base an interpretation of their work. The French philosopher Michel Foucault pointed out that the author of a text is sometimes a bit of a vague construct, even a brand. Basically, our reconstruction would kind of be an interpretation as well. Was that a YouTube as video as a citation? Lindsay, Lindsay Ellis? I think so. The author. I guess you yeah. can do that. It's just kind of yeah. interesting. She's still, uh, she's still not coming back, right? Lindsay Ellis. I'm assuming she may actually not come back at this point. I don't know. Charles shows us it's perfectly possible to imagine an idea of somebody in your head who supports your interpretation of their work, but who isn't that close to the real thing. Maybe your friend is flirting with you, but maybe you're just projecting because secretly you kind of want her to. Base joke. This is really hilarious. It's so what do we funny. conclude yet? Have we gone anywhere or? Um, <laughs> like in terms of it's like not. So much of it's not is dense. Oriented around like the the like asking, how much is it worth what the author says about their work, and what do you do if you can't ask them, because they're you know they're yeah. dead, like death of the author, right? Thanks. Um, but I mean, what are we gonna factor into this discussion at any point? What if you like just fundamentally disagree? with the way that the author explains the meaning of their work. Like, if they if they wrote that something the, as... Yeah? Was that what the citation for Death of the Author was? Is it sort of like, you are supposed to go consume that quickly so that you understand that part of the argument? Or is that no going to be this? I'm, well, well, no, because... Well, I, mean, I don't know. <laughs> well, like, we'd have to read, like, seven books, four articles, and three YouTube videos in the span of two minutes to get through this video. And I'm I, assuming I just... she'll go into death of the author. I think you have to yeah. for a conversation like this. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. I sure the hope so. The risk is that we just end up repeating what other people have told us about the artist's intentions, regurgitating the marketing rather than actually engaging with what they made. That's why the philosopher Roland Barthes said we should forget about the author and just focus on the text in his famous okay, essay, Death of the Author, which... Yeah, John is dead, so I guess you got what you wanted there. Roland Barth, where were you on the night that John Shade was murdered? Just to make things even more hate. This is staggeringly unfunny. Hey, wow. that's true. <laughs> but someone out there interprets it as very funny, Rags. Who's correct? Yes. No, they're wrong.
I draw oh. a hard line. The universe wrong. considers this unfunny. This is not funny. It's based, baked into the fabric of reality. But this is not funny. Hazy. The British art historian Michael Baxendall said that artists don't really have intentions for their work the same way that an architect has an intention for a bridge. When you design a bridge, uh, you plan it all out beforehand and you have a very clear goal in mind. But art... But, that, but that's, uh, that's far more... Uh, that's, that's, but that's based off of just the physical reality of having well, but, a bridge. Well, I, mean, I don't even you're know that it's true. Art, you're, you're implying that And also it depends on who... Art. Like, architecture, as a as both of my parents are architects, there is a very huge art component in the in, in that field. Yeah. Um, so when well, you're building um, a bridge, of course, like um, if like I we I live in Little Rock and we had a, we got a new bridge a number of years back, and there was a big deal in the city. There's a new bridge to span the river, and there are all these designs that were presented, and they showed them, they put them up, and I don't know how they eventually chose, but like the the Everyone assumes that the bridge will work, of course. So people would were they were judging it and looking at these bridge designs based off of their aesthetics. She probably wouldn't entirely. disagree with this, right? She's probably just talking in general, like the function of a thing, like something being designed functionally versus just like a. Like, there are so many exceptions to this. I feel like you have to acknowledge that even even still, trying to draw a distinction between these two is really awkward because a bridge being designed. I think that it's like, is there ever a bridge that's designed? It's going to be rare for British design strictly for utility. It's never considered to be what it looks like when it's done. Like, in terms of how aesthetically pleasing well, it is. Well, sure, but it's, it's a functional the... design, though. That's the most important part generally when we're talking about bridges. They're functional, but, right? Yeah, but couldn't you say the same about, like, like if you write a book, that it needs to be legible? Like, that well, there's a, a model bridge. that must be accounted for? I don't think that's the same thing, though. Why? Why is it not the same as saying that a book needs to, to needs to be written in English or legible to read as opposed to a bridge needing to be designed to cross is the same as art or can you function or phrase the question? Well, so I guess I guess it's a, the, there's a separation being drawn between like architecture and I guess what we would broadly consider like regular art forms like paintings and yeah. books and movies and stuff. Um, the impression I, as I understand it, is the architecture, like aesthetics are a big part of architecture. The like architecture, that, that that's like a huge focus of it. And of course it needs to be something that's functional. But if we're talking about the functionality of like art, you could apply that to a lot of things, right? Like a film needs to function I mean, in a when certain way. Like, yeah, yeah, when we say that there are, okay. there are aesthetic considerations to architecture, but the function of the architecture is the most important part. That's the foundation on which it's built. Not sure, but... I mean, you could say that that I guess it's something that we don't talk about, but yeah, like a book needs to be legible. Like if nobody can read it, that kind of gets in the way of anything else that you want to. Uh, Stops being a book at that point, right? I feel uh, like well, we're I having. Mean, I feel like it's a fundamentally different consideration. Like art is created to be perceived and enjoyed as art. A bridge can have art as part of it, but it forms the function of like us crossing the bridge. I think those are two. Yeah, like, that's sure. like saying like, well, everything is art because in order for it to be designed, it has to be seen and we see art. Like, I don't think that's a meaningful distinction. Like there's clearly sure. something is different happening when we create something like a knife to cut something could also be art. You could put art on the knife, but there's a function there that is independent from any artistic consideration as opposed to like a piece of art that's meant to be perceived like primarily as an artistic thing that doesn't have like a function. Doesn't this come uh, back to yeah. though? Because like I don't disagree. By the way, that they, we we could have bridge building or knife building that's strictly utility. They have no interest in the aesthetic at all. There's going to be instances where that takes place. But at the same time, with how we're defining art, would it not still be as a result of the person designing it, like an, an art? Like it would still qualify. I'm this, that's pretty much where I'm getting lost at this point. I don't see how we, at the fundamental level we can actually split them that efficiently. You know, like how cars are made. A lot of people. We've covered this sort of subject before. No, a lot of people bring up cars and be like, "Sorry, sort of, yeah, sort of what?" So like I got sort of know how they're made. Don't ask me any in-depth questions though, because I will not be able oh, to I think help. The point, I think okay. The point more making is that there is a clear functionality to cars in terms of they can get. There's a lot of people who bring up cars as an example of see that is function, not artistic work, and it's like, what? what That's are you, wrong. What? That's <laughs> absolutely wrong. Um, even though. Theoretically, and you know, I wouldn't even need to say three years. I'm sure it's happened. There's someone out there who built the car strictly for its ability to drive. They had no interest in the way it looked. But like, 
as a form of expression engineering, I think, because you brought this up, right, Destiny, in terms of uh, even coding, like when it's created strictly for utility, or that, that photo of the eye that we brought up, it's like, well, it's still, is it not like just as expressive uh, necessarily as, as any other, the other category? Like, I appreciate the intuitive sort of distinction between these two. I just think that if you're going to make a video about this, you have to acknowledge that there's a huge amount of crossover with the industries that are tied to these yeah, two things. Yeah, there's obviously going to be crossover, but it's fundamentally different. Creating something where function comes before form is going to be important, or it's going to be an important distinction between, like, just a piece of art, right? There might be some crossover, but we're not, we're not truly saying these are the same thing. They're different categories of things, right? Fun. Is it fundamentally different? Yes, it is hmm. fundamentally different. I will concede it is fundamentally different, though I think there's still a bit to dig into with how, when we, you know, like a life drawing? It's like, what comes first? Like, just your expression and, and how you want to make it or whatever? Or is it like, it still has to comport to a couple of things first, functionality, like, functionally? As in, it has to, uh, whatever materials you're using or... It, the ability to be perceived structurally, it has to actually follow a couple of rules, and then you can do whatever you want. Sure, you can say there's a function, but the function is to be art, right? It's not like functionally, like it's serving some of the, the function is to be art. The function of a bridge is not to be art. There can be an artistic component to it, but it's not supposed to be art. Or there might be some bridges that are yeah, art, and but. Yeah, what if someone got like the contract to make a bridge and first and foremost, they want it to be artistic. Be and it's also. Oh able to support cars and everything. Well, hold on. Then first and foremost, it's not to be artistic, it's to support that cars. That would be art then? That would be art before uh, architecture, would well, you maybe, say? Maybe, maybe here would be a better one. What if you had a car that was never gonna be driven, um, but it, it, it totally works, and it's gonna be displayed in a museum forever, but it's never gonna be driven, what is it? Sure, you could argue that that's art. Even though it is, even though like as a requisite for it being what it needs to be artistically, it fundamentally has to be a vehicle that works. It's a trick question because you're making it like, you're, 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 it's tautological. You're saying it's being created as artwork, but part of the qualification of it being art is to make it functional. Well, by definition, then it would be well, art, okay. but like you define the um, art as be, having the function of doing a thing, right? We can, we can remove that component then. It is a functioning car, but the purpose is for it to be displayed in a museum, like forever, or a gallery. Well, sure, but if part of the driven. part of the art is to make it functional, it's still art. But it's not like it was made as a functional car and then it became art. Part of, it was initially like that's it's you're kind of like. Well, so are we are we defining like when when are we determining like at what point does something become art? At that point, I guess if we're talking about like a. Well, I don't know. That's a like fundamentally different conversation. I'm just saying that there are things that are created that where the where the function initially is the important part, and that's fundamentally yeah, different sure. than something where the initial thing is just being art. I think um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that there is that actually applies to art as well, but it's just a way lesser degree. Um, and but the I think function of art is, least. but the function of art is just to be art. When you say that, like, oh, you have to make a book legible, well, that you're just making it art. It, like the function of it, though, the legibility of it is, is all the just function service. of art to be art, or is I thought the function of it was to, I, I mean, you could have art with different functions, right? If you want to, you know, express something or get an idea across or make people think a certain way. What do you mean? Like, not everyone makes art for the same reasons. So even though, so sh couldn't you have, like, art that doesn't necessarily fulfill the same function? Um, I, Theoretically, I guess. Or some things become art that weren't originally intended to be art, I guess. Because I doubt, I doubt that when people make art, they, well, I mean, maybe some do in their own way. But the function isn't to be what it is, right? The, the function isn't, oh, I'm, I'm making this art because I want it to be art. Well, depend. I mean, if we're talking about like painters or musicians, I mean, that kind of is, no? Oh, uh, I, mean, I mean, I don't know. It's that, that almost seems like I'm building a car so it can be a car, or I'm building a car so that it can transport well, here, people. Maybe here's a hypothetical. What if um, what if you have like a fire alarm that's going off? The purpose of the fire alarm is to alert people that there is a fire. They know that this specific rhythm means that it's a fire as opposed to some other thing, uh, and get them out of the building. And I don't know. One guy stops. He's like, man, the rhythm of that fire alarm. Like, oh, that's that's beautiful. It's like, so what? And of course, it's it's all auditory, right? It's like, so what? What is that? Do we say that that is like function before the art, or that like now it has become art strictly? Or, or like, which category would it fall under? Like, if we had this dichotomy between art and, in this case, well, I mean, like any. I mean, we've already. I think we've all kind of said that like anything could be perceived as art, but like it was originally created as a fire alarm, not originally created as an art project, right? 
Yeah, sure. But like, what, so I, I, I guess, um, <clears throat> oh, sorry. I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to think about where I'm, where I want to go with that thought. I will say that John Cage's 3 minutes 30 seconds would be a terrible fire alarm song. Probably. What, just because it's not going to work out very well, now. Silence for a while, at least. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm actually not sure like, what the conclusion I want to draw is. You design a bridge, you plan it all out beforehand, and you have a very clear goal in mind. But art doesn't really work that way. Every brushstroke you add to no? a canvas... By the way, yes, yeah, so I... I still think she's wrong, even if uh, I went with what you've said, Desi, because, like, you can build art that way, too. You can plan your artwork ahead of time entirely and then go forward with that. You don't necessarily... It's not necessary yeah, for art to change as you make it. Is the planning process that just strict and rigid? It's like, I don't think I think I'd is. have to back up and listen well, to the whole statement again. What, or what is the... Let's what is right. it? Let's call then. I'll lower it back a little bit, then. Look, the same way that an architect has an intention for a bridge. When you design a bridge, you plan it all out beforehand and you have a very clear goal in mind. But art doesn't really work that way. Every brushstroke you add to a canvas, every Not line necessarily. to a script, every note to a score changes the relationships between everything else and changes the whole. Yeah, because I don't I I don't agree, especially if you're making like if you're making a bridge oh. and you plan it all out beforehand, like what that that's what large sculptures are. There's plenty of very large art there, installations uh, that we are. We can all at least agree. It, it, it goes both ways. Sometimes you can plan out your art in a very rigid way and never deviate from that plan, but also you can build things that need to be functional and your plans will change based on new variables that come into play. And plus, yeah, like, why is the planning it, it, stage not counted as part of the artistic process here? Well, because we are drawing a distinction, right, between the way that these things are created. That because something has a functionality in the way that it's planned, like, it must work in a certain way. But, I mean, of course, you can have breakthroughs when you're creating something that is, like, utilitarian. If this is why the distinction is being drawn, I'm not really seeing, like, where that line is being yeah. drawn. I think she could like have done both. better at drawing this distinction as Absolutely. is, because now I'm like... If I just plan out to put like make a smiley face made of like five buttons and I draw out exactly where they're gonna go and then I do it, execute it as exactly the plan, would she still argue it's like, well that changed as you were putting the buttons down? I'd be like, I don't think so. At least not in any meaningful way. Or like, no, and not in I any gave significant an way. Standard to follow, in fact. And then Based flipping it plan. over, when they're making the bridge, I mean, yeah, it, it may go exactly to plan. But obviously, there's going to be plenty of times where it wouldn't for several possible reasons. It feels like a really weird distinction is what I'm saying. I'm guessing that the point that's getting ramped up to here is that the intentions of a creator will change over the course of their of their making something. And what does that say about its meaning? It's like, could that, could that not be applied to a lot of things? Like, including if we were talking about architecture, you know, if you were if you wanted to make something in a certain type of way. And then, I don't know, you got feedback. They're like, nah, this building looks kind of crappy. Can you change it? It's like. I guess if we're if we're trying to, I'm I'm curious as to why architecture or like I guess utilitarian like building things is being used to emphasize this point in terms of informing like the meaning. Could you say that ultimately the meaning of like when you set out to build a bridge, regardless of what it looks like, is to build a bridge? Okay, let's. Well, okay, hold on. Let's back up. Are, yeah. I don't like philosophy too, but let's try to extract more generally what I think she's trying to say here. So. When you're trying to build a bridge, okay, we're, we're almost getting like um, like platonic forms. What she's saying is that the construction of the bridge is serving a particular functional purpose, right? Um, that when you're trying to build a bridge, you're not discovering the bridge as the bridge is being created. You're not going to change up the bridge in relationship to something you discover along the way of creating the bridge in an artistic manner. Whereas like as you're creating a particular piece of art, because art is like all relational and there's not necessarily a final product in mind, you're not mass producing like one art piece, that, that the, 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 the creation of the art itself might change the final product since there isn't a rigid final product in mind the same way there might be with like the form of a bridge. Does that make sense? Yeah, but my whole yeah. point was that you've made her point better than she made it. Yeah, I understand. She's I'm just trying up. to read. Yeah, the way that she's phrasing everything is very sloppy and very stupid. But I'm, I'm trying to extract like what do I think she's trying to get at in the more generalized point. I think that's I think that's in general what she's saying. The, the way that she's expressing is stupid, obviously, because in the process of creating a bridge or anything else, things might change along the way. Or some people might set out very rigidly. Like if I want to do a portrait of somebody, I'm literally drawing a portrait. I have an end vision in mind in a strict way, maybe even more strict than in an engineering sense for like a bridge. But I'm just saying in general, I think this is what. 
she's getting at. I think she's trying to make the point that a bridge has, there is an idealized version of a bridge, but there isn't like an idealized version of a piece of art generally. You're trying to create something that's a little bit more um, expressive and not as functional as just like a bridge. I think is what she's ultimately getting at. Yeah, no, I got it. It's just a, it's super sloppy to say like artwork never, uh, artwork necessarily changes as it's created. I think that's really like in a in it's a, a video weird, called this art meaningless. Yeah, that's it's a one, weird point. That's a big slip. Yeah, yeah. As you work, your intention develops. So if we're trying maybe. to reconstruct the artist's intention, where yeah, do maybe. we start? There isn't really one intention. There's an infinite sequence of them. John Singer Sargent. I don't know about that. Uh, well, that's. <laughs> Is there? Well, what if we I, it out it, to the it, point where it's hard to decide that there's a lot. I don't, I don't there even can, think it, there can be. There can be. Yeah, there can be a lot. Yeah, there can be. Or the problem uh, is that the, making... the word infinite is a worthless word because there are many different types of infinity, and I think you can actually say that that's expressed right here. There are bounded infinities, right? There is an infinite number of numbers from the set of zero to infinity. There's also an infinite amount of space between one and two. So you can say that, like, yes. well, let's say I'm doing a portrait of somebody. Well, even within that bounded confines of a portrait, even in that bounded thing, there's an infinite amount of expression within the bounds of that. So saying anything is infinite is generally just like a pointless thing to say because there's an infinite amount of space between one and two and an infinite number of numbers. What does it mean to say something's infinite? Infinite, right? Yeah, and I was gonna say that it's like it's damaged the weird intention at this point because now it's kind of useless. You uh, had well, yeah. we were just talking about that red square on the wall, and she and she said it was about feeling trapped. It's like I don't. I mean, if that was literally all that the artist wanted to get across, then that's just one thing. Well, I guess it maybe depends we'll on come what you're creating. And... An example, right? Like what they said that they wanted it to mean versus anything else that they might have said at any point in time. And of course, what happens if after it's created? the author changes their mind. They're like, you know what? With some introspection, I now start to realize that that wasn't really what I meant when I was creating it. What I actually was expressing was this. Like, who do you, who do you yeah, default to at this stage? I think that's interesting. But when you say like, well, to be fair, he kind of has infinite intentions. If you consider the human existence, it's like, okay. Well, yeah, so I just, wait, wait, this, what are we doing? <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. It's just like, you just made it pointless. Why would you do that? Took almost a whole year What's to finish the portrait of Madame X. And he tried a lot of different poses before he settled on the final thing. Rothko took years to finish the Seagram murals, and he changed his mind about what he wanted to do with them. As somebody who is- Okay, love and then he settled on a What thing. the thought process was. I would see, I would find that part way more interesting than the, the outcome. Like, what was he thinking about before he did all that? If, I don't know how, what It's also like, oh, yeah. it her example breaks so much because this happens in engineering all the time. How many different times were the F-35s like redesigned over and over again? Like how many times is yeah. the building had like, it's kind of a bad example of yeah. something, but. But we can be mature yeah. and we can extract more what her general argument is, right? Well, we is can, a working yeah, artist. Totally. Huge brains here. Oh yeah, gigantic. I can tell you from experience that intentions absolutely change. I recently finished writing okay. a play. It's going to be on in London soon. I bet it's really it's funny. That was I'm a smooth really... ad transition. <laughs> I, because you know, like I can, I can confirm it myself because I've made things where I've changed. It's like, come on, none of us needed convincing. Yes, intentions can change. It's all good. But I'm, I'm happy for her that she's got a, a play. That's yeah, pretty neat. Sure. Get excited for it. Tickets available in the doobly-doo if you're interested. When I started it, I intended to write something about the monarchy. But the more I worked, the more I realized it actually needed to be about the something queen completely died. different. And the final product has almost nothing to do with that. So if we try to reconstruct my original intention to decide what the play is about, how is that going to work? It definitely I feel like, ask you, right? I feel like what this us. helps us lead to the conclusion, though, is maybe we should predominantly focus on what is actually in the story, yeah. rather than trying to do this game of reconstructing what people thought when they were creating something. Bro, because... With well to say is where you start, and then you include like perspectives, include, and the authors, you know, one could argue has uh, maybe his first in the queue, but not necessarily the most meaningful, because that's going to be pretty much figured out once you find out what everyone's saying and how it reflects on the actual stuff. Yeah, and you when it comes be... to being able to remember the things you think, and as years go by, and it becomes more and more unreliable, and that's just get very, very messy. Be wrong about art, but I'm still not clear on how you can make sure you're right. I am the make portrait sure? of Max by John Singer Sargent. Am I a study in light and shade? Or am I a sexual scandal? I have a suggestion. Oh. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm happy to say uh, that you yeah, can you validate can. both of those pretty easily. Yeah, it depends on who you ask, because those are relative to the people who either made it or are observing it. Observing it. Maybe you need a different angle on things.
Did you dress up for that? Yeah, why not? Like, oh, yeah, I'm the or something? Like, yeah, of course. It's interesting. Wow. Those paintings. I'm more interested in this than the red painting, okay? Wow. All of them viewed at the same time from different angles, because that's cubism, baby. Some people think that I am the greatest artworks of the 20th century. A lot of people look at me and they go, I don't get it. And my suggestion is, don't focus too much on the intellectual stuff or you might miss out on what the art really has to offer. The philosopher Susan Sontag. So that's, that stuff stop. isn't intellectual. Well, I just, that's a statement that's huge, right? Like don't focus that on is, That sounds stuff. like a, I that think right now, I think like she's that's... offering different points of view. I don't think she's necessarily saying like, you have to look at it this way. I think she's just offering up. Like, no, I, I, that's no, no, what no, I'm no, saying. that's not it's what like, we're saying. Yeah, th this is the intro obviously to this section. It's just like, this is gonna be complicated. I'm curious how she's gonna define like what the intellectual stuff would be. And uh, obviously this point of view of ignoring it. This is probably going to be the, the feel the artwork point oh. of view. Trying to interpret art. Stop trying to get it and just experience it. Like yeah. Duchamp's Fountain. Everybody I... says, oh, he's making a statement about the art world. And Picasso's paintings, everyone says, oh, he's asking the big questions. Like, <laughs> what if there was a really f***ed up looking woman? But art isn't a statement or a question. If it was, the can is that something that you could do? Just stop trying to understand things. Like there's, or is that oh. that almost feels like it's just a? Is that something I mean, you could just like flick off like a switch? Like I'm not going to try and understand it. Is that something you could I, suppress like consciously? When, there's, I think. Uh, go for it. There's two different ways to perceive art. One is through sense, and the other is to try to intellectualize it. Sometimes we get so caught in our heads, it inhibits our ability to accurately perceive the emotional thing or the qualia, the experience of the art itself. Um, if you have a good yeah. music teacher, this will be something commonly taught when you're trying to analyze like a particular piece of music. Sometimes students will get really in their head and they'll start like analyzing really crazy things. And if you've got a good teacher, he'll tell you, put your pencil down, stop thinking about it and just listen to what you hear. And when you take a moment, you listen, you're like, oh shit, okay, I understand now what's going on. But I was too caught up in intellectualizing before to just like take a step back and experience the art for what it is to, to try to figure out later what it what, what they're trying to do with it is essentially it's like mindfulness applied to looking at art pretty much like trying to observe things without judgments as best you can to just like observe the feelings that you have while looking at something or listening to something just kind of we're like yeah. we're defining intellectualizing then to be like you take the sense in and then you almost like analyze it well, you're letting your, you don't in. want to let your intellectualizing yeah. get in the way of the feelings of it like you can, if you think too much about a particular thing, you might miss out on a lot, and then you're not able to actually enjoy that particular thing because you over intellectualize it. Um, and that it, this relates to like a form of drawing meaning out of art, I suppose, it would be the because uh, it seems like section one is trying to cover whose intention would be, uh, and and how valid that can be, and it seems like she's deconstructed it to the point where we couldn't find an answer. Now we've moved on to just experience it. I'm not actually denigrating that. I'm just trying to establish that I think that's the structure we're going for so far. Um, yeah, it seems like we're floating basically different ways to try and get to the question of what the meaning of a of art is, like different methodologies mm -hmm. for figuring it out. The artist would just write it down. Art isn't philosophy with pictures. It's art. So turn off brain and tune in to the aesthetic experience. I sometimes feel a little bit like that with my videos. Sometimes people comment and they're like, can you just make a list of all your major points and read them out without all of the extra stuff? And I'm like- Yeah, you should communicate better. Hey, well, I actually I would prefer that, that she do this, yeah. not bullet points. Exactly. <laughs> like um, actually treat making videos no, I, as- I, I interpret process. those comments as, I didn't understand what you were saying. Could you- No, they, they just uh, said they, did, well. they, they don't want the fluff is what the, the, the comments were, right? They don't want the- uh, that's what they're to saying. Be, that the one thing I'll agree with you on, though, I'm assuming they mean cut out the jokes, which would be nice, I think. You make oh, I'd be, I would be pro that, but yeah, 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 I guess I just misunderstood what the commenter was saying there. Alleged commenter. Sometimes art is supposed to be difficult to get. For example, I have another novel here, What It Feels Like for a Girl by Paris Lees. Full disclosure, Paris is one of my best friends. But I liked her novel before we met. It's about a kid called Byron who grows up on a council estate in the Midlands and has a really rough time. And the whole thing is written in the dialect of that region. 
If you're not from that specific geographic and socioeconomic place, it is sometimes hard to interpret. And that's a good thing because, spoilers, Byron is trans, which is also never explained. There's never a scene where like a doctor turns up and explains to the audience what trans people are and confirms that Byron is one. The reader's struggle to interpret the text parallels Byron's own struggle to just live free of the interpretations other people push on them. The challenge to the reader is, even if you don't 100% understand this person, can you still feel for them? So in a way, if you 100% got it, you'd almost be missing out. Interpretation. So I, I understand I the spirit it. of the argument. Yeah. However, what do you do with people who are literally like, no, 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 I, I don't know what is happening. I don't even like, I can't grip. Because I was actually when thinking like, when, do, when are you supposed to have subtitles? And you might be like, what are you talking about? And it's like, well, I guess Snatch would be my go-to, right? The, um, uh, the, there's a selection of people in that that speak so fast and with an accent. I think this, the film puts subtitles in for you. I can't remember anymore. Point being, when do you put subtitles in versus enjoy the, uh, I don't know, the fact that oh. it's supposed to come across as... I guess that's down to the intention Andor. of the person creating it. I had this experience in high school. This is really interesting to me. Um, I, I actually didn't think back on this until past college, but it, it was more profound than I realized. Um, in high school, I was an edgy internet atheist. Obviously, like I'm hyper autistically analyzing everything because I have all the answers because I'm a fucking edgy high school kid. I remember that we read this book and this book was was really interesting in that it was it in some parts it was written in like a third person novel perspective like john walks over to his blah 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 he does that and then in other parts it's written in john's first person perspective but when it's the guy's name wasn't john but when he's writing himself um when he's writing himself the writing is like a little bit sloppy and um the the, the writing was so sloppy that in some parts it was almost like obnoxiously so, like some sentences could be interpreted in different ways. Um, and I remember that we were gonna bring the author to the school and I was gonna debate the author and say like, why would you make so many grammar mistakes? Like this is like illegible, like whatever point you're trying to get across is lost and blah, 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 blah. And uh, I'd, I'd actually written in the back of the book like a handful of like things I wanna bring up because I was I was an edgy fucking dipshit kid. And um, the um, it was it was a book about World War One. And it was a book about like the personal story of the guy, I think like trying to find his son on the battlefield that was eventually dead or whatever. And um, I, fuck, I wish I could remember what, exactly what this guy said, but I remember that um, I went to raise my hand, but somebody beat me to it where they asked, why did you decide to make this decision between writing like in a first person perspective and in a third person perspective? Like it, it seemed like such a stupid idea. And like some of these parts are illegible. And like, why did you even do this? And I think the author asked the students, um, the author asked, he said, there was a clear difference between my writing and the writing of the father that was looking for his son. And the students, everybody, obviously we all agreed. And the author asked the audience, he asked all of us, he was like, can anybody tell me for the final passages where the father finally finds his son and he finds that he's dead, does anybody remember if it was written from the father's perspective or if it was written in the third person perspective? And nobody knew the answer to that. And he said the reason why he did the two totally different writing styles, the reason why he presented the book as is, was because something that he wanted to get across is when he'd written about history, people have a very detached third person perspective of it, even though we experience it in the first person, and all the stories are incredibly important. And that even if there's like this jarring distinction between a first person perspective and a third person perspective, at the end of the day, we all interpret things as humans, and that it's important to realize that. And that was why he went between the actual two different writings. He gave that answer, and I thought it was a little bit pretentious at the time, but I remember thinking about that later past college. I was like, that's actually a really interesting perspective so i don't know that's just uh, one example of how you can present something in a way that's like kind of stupid or a little bit silly but there might be like a greater intention behind it that maybe gives you pause it's a thing to think about that's definitely yeah, um that's interesting ways of leveraging like the medium that you have to convey things like in an unconventional way mm -hmm. like that would be one example i imagine there are examples in video games right of like how much do you empower or disempower the player mm -hmm. to like emphasize a certain point or maybe even permadeath as a feature would be another like there's definitely a lot of these tools i guess it's um that's the point of the conversation i guess though right like um to figure out if these tools have been employed effectively or if um, there's a point where it becomes very difficult for most people to engage with the meaning of the story, mm -hmm. or to like really latch onto that meaning uh, or the way that they use those tools. Yeah. Because um, I was gonna say like uh, the, the example we were just bringing up in 
in Andor. And I'm still not fully convinced that we it was like a file or not. I'm not sure, but there's like yeah. a, a people that live on like a forest planet and they seem indigenous and um, everything they do in each of their scenes, there's no subtitles, but they talk to each other. And so you have to rely on, you know, movements, expressions and what they're handing to each other where they where they go. And we, we were like really liking that compared to having subtitles. Just we were like, we have to just, we have to pay even more attention because now we have to figure out, you know, they, they're making noises that we don't recognize at all. But from everything else, context clues, we can actually pick up communication to an extent, which is an interesting uh, format. I could, I could totally imagine the people who made that were like, oh, we did that on purpose to help feel like these people are um, mm -hmm. very distant from your civilization you, in yeah. terms of years. Yeah. Uh, or it could be that we just didn't have the subtitles. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, either way, it's, it's, mm -hmm. there's an interesting difference. But um, I suppose you run the risk, right? This is kind of like the hand-holding of writing. Mm -hmm. where you can explain to the viewer with a character looking at the screen, telling them what the theme is or something. Mm -hmm. Or you can give all the clues as to what it is and hope they pick it up. Or yeah. you could even go as far as making it so that you're deliberately making it hard to understand and you're just like, well, if you got it, you got it. If you didn't, you didn't. I can think of a, I can think of a really good example of this in media, and I can think of a really bad example of this in media. Um, do you remember the uh, end of Whiplash? Yes. yes. You don't even see his full face, I don't think. I think you only see the director's eyes at the end, but you know exactly. You see you, Fletcher's eyes. Yeah, you yeah. know that and he's like smiling. There's, yeah, mm -hmm. like it's visible in the cheeks. Yeah, of, and you like know that so much is communicated there, and yeah. it's like, yep. it's perfect. It's, yep, in it's done room. perfectly. A really example of a bad way of doing this, I think, I hope I'm not remembering this incorrectly, but um, in, I think in Interstellar, the daughter yeah. is learning that the time formula was already solved by the old guy and that he'd solved it and it was fucked. It did, there was no way off the planet. But I think while he's explaining that in his deathbed or something, the music is cranked up really, really, really loud. And Nolan's Nolan's explanation of this is, I want to weave dialogue and music together. And sometimes you can't hear all the words and that's okay. But it doesn't work if you're communicating dialogue that the audience needs to understand the plot, right? That's not like, if you want to crank some really romantic tune up while two people are saying that they love each other and that's communicated on screen, you see, you don't necessarily need to hear it, that's fine. But when... Um, when a, not disposition, when a exposition is being given and it's really important to the plot and music is cranked up, that's really obnoxious, you know? And I think Nolan has a problem yeah. with that, with cranking the music too much. We actually need to hear the dialogue. He's well, almost famous I, at this point for his mix being fucked in a lot of his movies. It's really weird considering how like beloved and talented he is. It's, it's so weird that that would be a problem he has. It's almost consistent. I, th I think that all of this highlights that when it comes to this, like using more unconventional uh, means of, of conveying your story, that it really is like a blurry line here mm -hmm. of at what point does the way that you've chosen to convey this completely obfuscate the average person's ability to understand what you're trying to say. Mm -hmm. Or like understand what the story is trying to say if they view it, you know, as its own mm -hmm. thing. Interpretation is the revenge of the intellect upon art. Even more, it is the revenge of the intellect upon the world. To interpret is to impoverish, to deplete the world, in order to set up a shadow world of meanings. Real art has the capacity to make us nervous. Interpretation makes art manageable, conformable. Right, so what, what do we think of that statement? Uh, I don't have positive not, opinions of this. I do not have positive opinions of this quote, no. I think there's um, I think there's a lot of really good stuff to dig into with this quote. Like, um, I think that this is the I think this is one of the big issues you have in high school English classes, where when you're reading, you get into this hyper autistic fixation where teachers are telling you like, well, this means this and this means that and this means that and this means that. And I think it's possible to pick intellectually pick something to death until like you don't really have that emotional meaning out of it at all anymore. Um, I understand what they're saying here in terms of interpretation is the revenge of the intellect upon art, where art is supposed to be this qualia, this experience of seeing something. And when you go through, it's almost like explaining a joke. Like, it's not as funny after the explanation. It's not as artistic after the hyper nitpickiness. Um, somebody might have that feeling, I think. Not to say that, like, you should never that, intellectualize art, uh, but, like, you can do it too much. So I would way. agree that that is a possibility that comes from that way of discussing. But I would also say that sometimes having discussions with people that I guess you could say is, like, intellectualizing the art can help explain why it was so meaningful or valuable to you. Yes. Like, why certain things were working from cinematography, the way that the music complements the scene. Like, intellectualizing can absolutely ruin your uh, ability to enjoy something, but it can also enhance your ability to enjoy yeah, something. Um, it could, yeah. Someone I wanted to go with, because, you know, she's got, um, it has the capacity to make us nervous with real art. 
What I find interesting is though, have you seen Bly Manor, uh, the haunting of Bly Manor, Destiny? I'd imagine not. Nope. So that's a show about is ghosts are in it. To be nice and simple, um, we we were very fond of it. A lot of people weren't, and uh, one of the big criticisms the show got was that it's not scary. It's it's marketed as a horror, but it's just not scary at all. Mm -hmm. And um, we found that uh, there's a chance, with, at least with many of the people that I was showing it, like because I watched it with a couple people just to just try and understand what's not working and what is working, uh -huh. the mechanics themselves for how the ghosts work and what, what happens to them in there can be a little bit difficult to to sort of put everything together in terms of all the events and how the mechanics work. When you understand them fully, I think they're horrifying, like existentially, once you understand what the show is saying, what it means to be a ghost in this world. Um, yeah. And so it's almost like the show isn't as scary until you understand how it all works and how it all comes together, and then it becomes incredibly scary. Um, yeah, at least... understanding it makes it, it turns it into something else that's even more intense and gives you even more of a, a reaction to it and a response to it. Which is why right. ending the quote with interpretation makes art comfortable or manageable. I'd just be like, I mean, it can, but it also does the opposite depending on... I don't think understanding Soma makes Soma some, like safe and comfy the more you learn it seems <laughs> sure it, it but I, when they're talking about intellectualizing in here they're probably not talking about giving you an explanation that's like expanding upon the art they're probably talking about the type of like hyper analyzation that might happen within the confines of an art class where like if you learn that well this art is incredibly beautiful because of the 90 degree angle and blah 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 that when you get hyper right. fixated on it you might not be able to take a step back and just like perceive the, the art and see it as beautiful trade. Which what? is odd because a lot of the times those are called art appreciation classes, and they get into a lot of the nitty gritty of yeah, because why this is why this this is why this, and so now you have a more un, more of an understanding of it, and you can appreciate it in a way that you might not have before. You can, this but there quote, are also um, like really good examples of people being, in my opinion, I think sometimes people get robbed of their appreciation of stuff by being too analytical. Um, I, a lot of my examples are music inspired because that's what I went to school for, but I'll use this. Film students can do this too. Um, when, when film students say things like, I can't enjoy superhero movies. They're just far too simplistic for me. It's like, uh, how can you not enjoy superhero movies? Uh, like, you just watch people beat things up. It's, it's just like mindless entertainment, but it's fun, right? Like masturbation can be fun. There's not something like very sophisticated happening there. Like there are some people that become so intellectualized with their engagement of art that they lose the ability to actually enjoy some piece of art. And I've heard music, music people say, I can't listen to modern pop music. There's nowhere near the level of sophistication I've grown accustomed to after analyzing Baroquean pieces and classical pieces and romantic pieces. And it's like, bro, you're literally robbing yourself of the ability to enjoy art because you're over intellectualizing it so much like what's happened to you i think that's what this quote is speaking to i i don't disagree i just um it feels really bitter this, this uh well of course it is this, it sounds like it's written by a person who's arguing literally against the over intellectualization of art but i mean like a yeah, lot of artistic to... movements are pushes like postmodernism is a push against the modern uh, rational man's obsession with trying to organize and catalog all of events in human history in some uneasily digestible understandable pattern so of course the postmodernist mocks the modernist and they mock the ability to try to create narratives to explain all society and of course it's going to come off as bitter but like what is art and 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 academia if not like a bitter response to the era that came before right also i go on to say that it's caused them to have the almost equal and opposite bad perspective like that they've managed to conclude now that it's the opposite which is still like I, I feel like both sides would be just as wrong as each other well i mean there's going to be some form in every academic and in every art sense there's going to be some form of, of of synthesis and analysis or analysis and synthesis where i'm sure that like some people come out and in response they make like hyper scathing critiques and probably from these critiques there's going to be a new form of academia or a new form of art that's born that will not only resemble things of the past but it'll incorporate uh, like critiques of the of the current art forms as well that'd be my guess right i'm sure that that's probably happens in all art forms mm -hmm. I, I certainly disagree with the the element of in this quote i guess i'll roll it back uh, okay. just a yeah. moment but uh to interpret is to impoverish and deplete the world when i think interpretation i mean it necessarily almost adds like it adds more than oh, i think I it guess would take it would away. just be that it, it a lot of these i would just say interpretation can be the revenge of the intellect upon art to mm. interpret to me, it can seems impoverish so and delete yeah, the world interpretation can make art manageable and because right what you they would tell you an interpretation is boxing it in while you'd be like no it's offering one more viewpoint on top of the base viewpoint of just experiencing it and then you can have you, you i imagine that's what you'd say right you, you every time someone along says those like, lines yeah like this I, means I, this I, it's like yeah they're guess, adding um, to the conversation rather than taking the, away you almost want to ask oh go for it you, so you, you almost want to ask like 
do you want your art to be like it does need to be understood for a lot of its effects to probably take hold right if you're if you're trying to get across a message or a feeling or something there has to be some level of interpretation and understanding for us to draw out what you'd like us to draw out hey it probably depends on the I art guess, um... yeah it goes it depends yeah. on the art yeah but i would imagine that's guess... really broadly true to me, I guess it comes across as people should give more thought to like squaring away how something made them feel versus like the conversation that they will have about it in terms of explaining what they think works and doesn't work on a craft perspective. Like that these are things that you can insulate from one another. Like you can rec- I mean, it's it, the, the clear example is, yeah, that movie's bad, but I like it. Or I recognize that that film is great, but it just doesn't do anything for me. That's essentially just squaring away. Your emotional response is one thing. And then you having a discussion about its merits uh, from a craft perspective is another thing. That like they don't need to be competing or like yeah. one comes at the expense of the other. That you mm -hmm. can try to have two separate conversations. Because of course, if you talk about a film that uh, covers some event that is really meaningful to you personally because of your life history, that's not necessarily something that you could. It's going to be difficult to map the feelings that you had from that onto somebody else. But I mean, you can still talk about it, and um, and 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 that's still like valuable in and of itself, even if it's not like a meaning that you would like that you would create. This is the meaning that must be stemming from it. That you can separate those two discussions, rather than I guess making it seem like they're both competing and only one can prevail over the other. Just nervous. Interpretation makes art manageable, conformable. I think we can really get to grips with this idea by looking at the work of modern American playwright David Mamet, who is a little bit of a problematic fave of mine. In 2009, Mamet wrote a play Did he have an called opinion? Race. The story is, content warning, a wealthy white man has been accused of raping a young black woman. The whole thing is set in the offices of his defense lawyers as they try to invent some way of getting him off the hook. The witnesses say that they heard sex noises and racial slurs being shouted. So the defense they concoct is that she was into that. The whole thing was actually consensual and she's just lying to get his money the slimiest possible thing but i can think of some worse things than that. it probably is worse things but yeah. i mean it's only slimy as long as it's not true and assuming it's not the, the point of the story as in that it's a the lawyers are concoct story. she said the lawyers are concocting no. it so yeah yeah i guess it's baked into the thing of the like like the book wants you to know that that isn't actually how events took place or maybe we don't uh, know, and that's an element of the book. Like, we don't actually know. Uh, maybe we're about to find out. As the play maybe. goes on, it starts to emerge that maybe that really is what's happening. Maybe there really maybe. is some kind of reverse racism, reverse Me Too thing happening here. And Mamet loves to write these kinds of stories. He did another play called Oleana, which is about a female student who falsely accuses her professor of sexually assaulting her. But then... He really does! <laughs> he loves to write these Tim Pool ass thought experiments. If um, I would just be curious because I'm. Tim Pool ass thought experiments. I've seen some people say that they're familiar with that play. I'd be curious how that works narratively because how would it become a surprise that that was the truth when the, the defense lawyers presumably would have his input and he would be able to suggest that yeah, as a truth, I mean, right? Not a lie? I mean, well, she described you don't know if you can trust him or not, right? To no, no, of course, but like I thought, it, I thought the story was presenting it as though the defense lawyers came up with it as if because that may be valid. Not that that was literally his defense, because she says like, "Oh, that's disgusting," right? And it's like, well, it would be disgusting if it were a lie. But if in the story it's presented as his story versus her story, I don't know why we would side with hers. Yeah, I have no clue what the actual necessarily. Truth is. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, do I like, have the perspective of a jury member or something, or does the book tell me what's actually the case? Yeah, because this isn't. I'm. I'm sure what she's saying is completely true. I'm. I'm curious how that would work in in how they tell the story. Uh, that that would be a surprise to us. That eventually it becomes true, or is it that the film frames it so that we? Oh, sorry, the story frames it so that we more likely believe uh, her, but then maybe her yeah, story mean, starts to have holes in it or something. I imagine there's a ton of different ways it could go, right? I suppose so. He does. <laughs> he loves to write these 
Tim Pool last thought experiments. If you tried to take race, I think they're and interesting. Translate it into a political statement. The statement that you get would probably be a little bit incoherent. And I'm not just saying that because I personally disagree with Mamet's politics. In his book, Theatre, he occasionally talks about his political views and it contradicts itself from chapter to chapter. The stuff about theatre is really interesting. The stuff about politics kind of reads a little bit like discount Jordan Peterson. And fair enough. Okay. Man's a playwright, not a political scientist. But Are you? I saw Race on Broadway in 2010 and it was electric. The performance was so good that when I came out of the theater, I was like, that's it. I have to be an actress. And years later, I did a monologue from race at my drama school auditions and I got in. Mamet says that if you are writing a play, creating a work of art for the stage, forget about politics, forget about interpretations and meaning and getting it and all of that. Is it entertaining? Oh. Do the audience want to know what happens next? Uh, I, I, I feel like that was all leading to a different place. Uh, this I always feel like this is square one, um, which is not a problem, by the way. Like as a perspective, just like is it entertaining? It's like I mean, yeah, we've all got that in our head about like m l making a story, making a film, making, making any piece of art. You're hoping that people will be uh, engaged by it. I think but some like, people, I think some people will create art to serve a political narrative. Well, arguably, actually. We could argue that this is the the meat of the woke art problem, where people think you're not creating art to be entertaining. You're just creating art to share your political perspective. I think that it's really fascinating. Maybe one of the most fascinating things is there are some people that manage to create incredibly thought-provoking art, and their goal is to just make something literally entertaining and not thought-provoking at all. I somebody call me somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I read in an interview with the um, the guy that did the manga for Death Note. I don't think he gave a fuck at all about whether it was right or wrong for L to be killing people based on whether or not he thought they were good or bad. That's like an issue, a theme that he didn't care about. He didn't explore. He only wrote the back and forth between L and um, uh, Light. I'm sorry. Light was the one Light, he was writing. Yeah. Is, he only wrote the back and forth yeah. between L and Light. Um, and I thought it was interesting that because the quality of the writing and because the quality of the story and everything was so high, that's a theme that almost unintentionally gets a little bit explored. And people come away thinking like, oh, well, you know, was Light in the wrong? Was it okay to do that? Is it not okay to do that? But his goal when creating that, I don't believe it was to explore that question at all. He didn't even care about it. He was like, I, I, I largely don't leave this um, addressed. I just want to make something that's very entertaining. But by making it so good, you end up inadvertently exploring those types of ideas. Well, it's, uh, it reminds me of like Tolkien talking about how he doesn't care for allegory. Yep. Despite Lord of the Rings being, you know, everybody draws allegory from Lord of the Rings. Um, though th th there's more to that quote. I wouldn't want anyone to think that I'm like limiting him to only have said that. It's it's just that it's yeah, it, it does come up. I what what I guess I I mean is just that if someone tells me to be insightful about the nature of art, mm -hmm. just ask yourself, was it entertaining? I'm just like oh, I already. I knew that part. I don't know. I was hoping well, I don't, for more. I don't think they're not just saying just entertaining, but they're saying that like it should be created in service of being an entertainment thing first. And then if you want to work political stuff in, that's cool. But don't just try to make a piece of political art. Like it has to be art. It's got to be cool and entertaining and it's got to serve it, like the purpose of art, which is to be entertaining and, and a cool experience before anything else. Which I think is what do you think about that? Is that does that have the does art have to be with the purpose of being entertaining? Well, not enter well, no, I was gonna... entertaining is a stand-in for like serve like so. If it's music, it's something that pleasant pleasant to listen to. If it's a movie, something that's pleasant to watch. I think that's what. Well, like, maybe, maybe what if, that's uh, what. It's, what if, well, I guess like sad music is we like to listen to it, but maybe like <clears throat> it, it depends on what we mean by entertaining. Do we mean engaged or compelled? Like it's um. If you get what I mean, like yeah, um, yeah, because I think didn't Total Biscuit mean? come across this? He was like, you wouldn't want to describe. Was it Spec Ops uh, the Line as entertaining? Was, yeah, he, he said like for his top ten games of the year that Spec Ops the Line is a valuable game, like it's a game that's worth playing, but he wouldn't call it a fun game or like an entertaining game. He wasn't yeah. he wasn't having fun while playing it, but it was obviously captivating, and so that's mm -hmm. exactly because I imagine that people who are uncomfortable describing Schindler's List as entertaining, they'd be, there's yeah. going to be people who'd be like, I wouldn't call it, you know. But um, it is entertaining, right? But it's just it's, it, it feels like a demeaning thing to say it, right? Like Uncut Gems is very engaging. entertaining. Well, sure. 
Uncut Gems is very entertaining, yeah. but many would describe it as like it's very stressful or good times, right? It's like very, very yeah. stressful, right? But it's still like a form of entertainment. You wa you choose to watch it, right? It's not it's not the same kind of stress as like forgetting a college assignment, right? It's clearly a different type of stress, right? Well, it's it's um with a lot of uh with a lot of art, a lot of it is indulging in what would otherwise be negative emotions for some level of um yeah, engagement essentially. Like, why do you play? Like, it's not fun to be scared. Yet, when you're playing a horror game, it mm -hmm. can be engaging or entertaining to be scared, or yeah. you know, made sad or angry. Sure. Um, like a lot of a lot of the negative emotions are like a big part of artistic expression. Mm -hmm. So I guess, yeah. A lot of people's theory on like what makes bad art is not negative experience. It's nothing, right? Like when it does Apathy. nothing to you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Difference. Yeah, and a negative emotion explored in a safe context can be a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, that's that's what art helps us do. I mean, what is what is a lot of video games of not being able to participate in simulated danger, rather than you know actual murdering like, scores going of people, like an action adventure thing, or yep. you know going up against zombies or monsters. Remember, remember the no no Russians. Fuck. I was just about to say. <laughs> I know. <it. laughs> Glad I cut you off, motherfucker. Well, it's just that shit was edgy, man. I'm super, I'm thinking about like looking back on Ball Wolf for two. That game had plenty of edge in it. Do they? How are the new cards doing for 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 edge? Because I, I didn't even play the campaign uh, on the. Modern Warfare, the new Modern Warfare uh, was. I would say that it was um, somewhat gutsy at parts. Uh, I'm not sure about Modern Warfare two though. I get the impression from the trailers that it's leading more into being like an action, like just a bombastic action movie, which is kind of it's kind of. The trajectory that Modern Warfare originally took, right? Like, as the Modern Warfare series went on, it became more and more insane. Like, yeah, any instead of... Yeah. It by, like, any even plausible scenarios was out the window. Oh, wait, was um, that... Yeah. Was that called for Modern Warfare 2? I'm mixing them up. Call it, Modern Warfare 2 was no Russian. Um, oh, okay. But Call of Duty 4 had, like, the Pripyat missions and, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and World of and War that, felt really raw. Modern, uh, well, yeah, raw. World of War is uh, a confronting game, that's for sure. If you a work of art and you're trying to get it, then you're a fool. The play, the story, that's the thing that we're here for. As I wonder if you would have never got it, so to speak, where would, you know, that I, I feel like that was very valuable to you that you sort of intellectualized it in a way and it led you on this journey and got you to where you are you know if, if you hadn't have ever had any of those thoughts in your head would you have been here you know it, it kind of seems like it's really important to do that if anything this is similar um, to where you were heading but um what does it look like for the person who expresses this perspective to talk about the play to someone else who shares that perspective when they didn't intellectualize it but they talk about the play i feel like if they were to express like how they felt watching it, fair enough. But as soon as they start talking about it, you have to intellectualize means... it to communicate it. Yeah, I'd be I curious. I, I want to know what a whole conversation like. looks like where you haven't intellectualized a piece of art at all. Well, like, uh, okay, okay intellectualizing. Possible. When you talk about like intellectualizing art, right? You're going to be talking more about like the actual descriptive things that are happening, rather than like the way a thing made you feel, right? So, like, for instance, yeah, like, if it's... somebody talks to me about, like, um, why do you like, um, why, why do you like the Interstellar soundtrack, right? In terms of how that made me feel, I loved all of the, um, all of the repeated themes. I liked how haunting it sounded. I love the organ, which is a great choice. Talk. It's like a big breathing instrument. It feels very human-like. That's, like, one way to say it. Or another way to say it is, how did you like Interstellar? Well, the repetition of ostinatos throughout a lot of the songs, which is an incredibly effective way to convey both stress and whatever. Um, I think that the utilization of simplistic instrument patterns painted a certain type of tonal, like there's a way you can like, that's like a highly intellectualized version, but you're not really, how does it make you feel? How did you feel about listening to that, right? I think that's the difference between like, what's an intellectualized take on art? It's like a very like discreet description of all of the individual aspects or building blocks of the art versus the overall impression that it made on you and the way that it made you feel. Uh, would you agree that there was that there was a blurry line uh, in terms of like intellectualizing versus explaining how it made you feel with reference to the things that were in it? I mean, you can combine, stuff, you can yeah, mix the blurry. two, right? Like, so oh, well, I guess um, <clears throat> like an example recently is uh, in Andor in the first episode. There's uh, a part where Andor has been chased down by like these security guard cop type characters, and the camera like hangs on his face for a good minute. Uh, just like hanging on his reaction as they're coming closer, they're totally out of focus. Um, like, uh, the, obviously, like the the intent there or the the point, the feeling that they're getting across is we want to be like really focused in on how he's feeling, like how 
uh, you know, the stress is ratcheting up. And if you're talking about like, yeah, that made me feel stressed. And then you start talking about like, well, because of um, the fact that like they're so out of focus, so it's kind of hard to tell what they're doing. Like, yes. just like him, we don't well, know we what his intentions him. are because they're yeah, you're out hitting, of focus and blurry. Yeah, you're hitting us on this yeah. really important, okay? And this is the, the number one thing I wish I could convey to every art student. You have to understand this. All forms of art study, the only thing you should be trying to do there is figuring out why art makes us feel the way that it does. It's not, it's, it doesn't tell us how art makes us feel. It, it describes how art makes us feel. Um, so like, in, like if you look at something called music theory, music theory exists not to tell us how to write music. It tells us why things sound the way they do to us. That's the whole point. The whole point of any art is to do that. So, um, or the whole point of any art study is to do that. So when you're talking about like intellectualizing things, it's good to intellectualize things such that like, I want to understand this so that I can understand why it made me feel the way that it does. Just don't disconnect the description from the feeling. That's the important part. As long as you're doing that, you can like intellectualize and talk about the feelings at the same time, but don't disconnect the two. Um, yeah, I mean, I would agree that I think that, um, I do think that, uh, like, when it comes to people trying to figure out, I guess, how to be good at creating art, that, like, you can very easily fall into the... Fuck yourself the, Like, what, what are the rules that I'm supposed to use? Like, three-act structure and, um, and, like, passive versus active characters. Like, these are the tools that I'm meant to use to, like, and then you start doing that while being totally disconnected from, like, the fundamental drive that is behind the story that you want to create. Like, yeah. Because, I mean, ultimately, everybody's going to have, like, if you have an idea that arises for a story that you want to tell, it's going to be hard to, like, intellectualize why you have that feeling or why you ought to pursue that um, or, like, how to best do it. Um, but, yeah, it really is a matter of, like, pairing and understanding of things that will generally work or the tools that are at your disposal with the ultimate, I guess, fundamental yearning to tell that story. And, yeah, I think people can get totally lost in, like, the mm -hmm. tools rather than... The we actually uh, we covered a video that had described they they knew the exact time code in which the You're inciting right. incident should take place. They said it, eleven minutes was it? At what? What should take place? The inciting incident in a story oh, has gotcha. to take place at eleven minutes in. It is. Uh, it's I don't almost know how like exactly if... they figured that out, but that's the kind of shit I'm talking about. Where it's like you've just you, you're fucking yourself over. Yeah, like, for sure. You reference some book or something like that. I, I forget the specifics, um, but it. It, so it wasn't Phil Bento. To... No, it wasn't Phil Bento. What was no, it, it was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Close Look, mm. Dune needed to have its, like, what, first act break at a certain point, and they didn't do that, and so... It was very critical of Dune. You liked Dune, didn't you, Destiny? I fucking hated Dune. What a god off. No, 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 hold on. It's not that I hated Dune. It's that Dune is objectively dog shit fucking art. Oh my Whether god. you're intellectualizing it or not, it's just bad. And the people that liked it, their subjective feelings are wrong. They're actually wrong objectively <laughs> about their experience. What a boring dog shit. If you like that movie, you should talk to a therapist immediately. There's shit in your life and you get sorted out because your brain is broken. Whoa. I love sand. I just, I just love it. I just love sandy places. It's like soft. A it gets yeah, all it's, over you. It's soft and it's not irritating and it yeah. doesn't get anywhere. Yeah. Objective statement, all three of the last Star Wars movies we're all better than Dune. Oof. Oh my god. <laughs> that's that's uh that's a okay, what, do, what do you two gotta talk about? I'm just trying to trigger the fuck out of everybody. <laughs> sorry, but anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Equals we'll talk you... about. Yeah. You know, Sitch is still trying to sort that out. They want they want yeah. us to yeah. fight. Well, one day I'll rewatch all those movies, so and then you'll realize how wrong you are. Maybe. Those movies are remember tiny. you'll always have the opportunity to bow out of that discussion when you see oh, the yeah. light. <laughs> yeah. As somebody who's just finished writing a play and is going to be in it soon, there have been times where I've found that to be really useful advice. In fairness, I'm white, so when I watch Race, I can turn off the bit of my brain that worries about the politics stuff. Maybe someday David Mamet will write a play about trans people and I won't have the luxury of being entertained anymore. But for now, let's take this idea and run with it. Forget about trying to interpret the art. Just, how do you feel? When I look at Rothko, I feel... Uh, big. Uh, it's black. It's uh, sorry, I'm a little lost here with the where we are at and what's happening. Did it? Did the oh, video so, just? So uh, she's concluded in section two. The meaning of art just comes from you experiencing it, and so now she's just trying to tell you how she felt when looking at the Rothko paintings. Which again, like this, we kind of went over this. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what I would draw from this. I. I just. It's not. It's like simultaneously like meaningful and meaningless to me. I, I don't um feels like we bring all of it to, to to the work but it's fine whatever she's about to say uh 
I wouldn't necessarily find much to, to draw from it, but um, that's okay too, I guess, is, is the conclusion. I don't know. Maroon, it's red. It's, uh... I feel humbled. Uh, I feel... You do? In all... By that? Feel... All right. Someone could say anything. I, I don't. I don't think there's yeah, any limit. Yeah, just like I. I would be curious why that thing on the wall humbles you. It does the opposite for me. Um, Sad. Ah, it's very inspiring that somebody can. Yeah, it, it kind of makes you feel like anyone could be an artist. You know, I think it's very, very inspiring that you too, you too, regardless, you could have your stuff hanging up in a gallery well, one day. It, Hundreds of millions to write the movies that we review. Hundreds Absolutely, these people—they're—they're they're terrible writers. And look at them—you know—you could do it. Go that ladder. You can climb it too. That's right. You know Very that high. feeling where, where some something bad happens, but you kind of knew it was going to. Like when somebody tells you they don't love you anymore, and you kind of saw it coming, or. You're at a funeral and the person's died, but they've been ill for a really long time. And it's like, well, it's sad, but at least it's done now. That's kind of how Rothko makes me feel. All right, he makes me bored out of my fucking mind. Both? And, all right. Yeah. That would be valid. This is, this is the thing, though. Like, I just don't know what to do do with any yeah of i don't know what to do with this either i'm just like uh, okay good for you i suppose which um almost denotes that my interest maybe when i hear someone's interpretation of the art is to see how they got it from it um but to also that take would be far more interesting that would be something i feel far more you know something to latch well, on to what i'm saying is that that's clearly something that i do anyway and so that with seemingly not seeing any connection at all i'm not interested in the analysis it's, it seems that's where my brain is uh which I think reflects a lot of people, but simultaneously some people don't care. They'll just be like, whatever, I just want to hear whatever you felt. Especially the artist, I'd imagine. Or at least that is part of it. But there might be a bit of a problem here. Truth be told, whenever I'm in an art gallery, I always feel low-key anxious because I used to date an art historian. And we would sometimes go to galleries together. We're talking ancient history now, so years and years ago. But that relationship ended pretty okay. badly for reasons that were my fault. So now, whenever I'm in an art gallery, I'm always like, what if she's here? I can't play the song because it reminds me of you. Okay. My point is, people feel all sorts of things when they look at art. Sometimes I look at Rothko and I feel anxious about my ex. Sometimes I look at Rothko and I feel like suddenly I have to pee. So which feelings are the right ones? Even if I'm just focusing on my emotional reactions. I don't think anybody's going to be saying right or wrong, right? It's, it's like so fun. You're wrong. Point, it's always tiring. <laughs> it's like, kind of. Um, I'm just sort of waiting for the th things to be said that I could really sink my teeth into. Yeah. How do I know that I've got it? We can probably narrow it down a little bit. Like we could... Well, wait, 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 when you say, how do you know you got it? That means that you're you're implying that there is a correct thing to take away from it. Wait, we're still using you're the trying method to get getting the intention? Because I thought we were onto the getting it at this point format wise is to just experience, right? Isn't that what? Experience and not to intellectualize or over interpret. But now we're talking about how do I know if I did get it, which seems almost like not the thing you want to do if you're trying to avoid interpreting and intellectualizing because yeah, this one is just you scored the victory by experiencing um which is fine if it's that was fine. your point of view about how art yeah. works and stuff it's just the i suppose as far as it goes you could say that your feelings should be caused by the particular artwork you're looking at yes i might look at rothko actually that was something i forgot to sort of counter my own argument with um when we like watch a film or, or whatever we still bring with us all of our daily experiences and life experiences and stuff right yep so technically speaking that still happens even though i'm saying that that's the would have been more so i guess i just feel like the ratio is increased when you look at someone uh, the rothko paintings or whatever but there's no way i can really prove anything like that um it's just that uh it feels intuitive to point it out i guess go and feel anxious about my ex but that's not caused by rothko any painting in any gallery would do that I might look at it and feel that I have to pee, but again, that's not caused by the Rothko. That's just coincidence. But even then, 
What? Well, if you recognize it as coincidence. <sighs> trying to well, sorry, I guess I'm just I, trying to walk through this. Up. Was there talking about like how, um, well, remember in The Simpsons how like when Homer was sitting there and like the bus said flushing meadows and that just made him want to go to the bathroom? Maybe sometimes art can. Well, I think she's, time. that's what she's, well, she's, she's exploring the idea was... right now that this is a thing that happens, that there might be some meaning that's yeah. totally outside of the control of the artist. Kind of like what I said earlier yeah, when I brought up the music. Thing. I thought you were going to reference the, the, uh, the sculpture you accidentally made with the barbecue. Um, oh, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah. Oh, that shit's yeah, great. That's, well, that's a great example of Death of the Order, isn't it? I guess so, yeah. That might not be enough. Whenever I look at the Seagram murals, I think about Spider-Man 2. The story of oh. how Rothko made them was adapted into a play called Red, which starred Alfred Molina, who played Doc. They adapted the paintings into a play? The I Red painting? That, that feels like taking some creative liberties. I <laughs> feel like, <we'd>, yeah. I, <laughs> to adapt we that saw painting these red, We saw these red squares and we made a whole movie about them. Like, all right, I, man. All right. I don't know about you guys. I don't know if I find out what this play's like. <laughs> it's just a series this of red rooms. Unless we're referring to Red with Bruce Willis, which is probably oh. not what they're referring to. Well, but maybe it is, I don't know. Red Dog starring I... Red Dog. Prove or, your truth, I mean, man. What does Red stand? Hold on, I'm gonna warm up for one sec. Wait, or, what? Huh? I said prove you're a true fan. What does Red stand for in that movie? You're John Elroy right? Stanford. No. Red retired, extremely dangerous. Did you type that in or did you know? I'm curious. No, I knew it. It's in the, it's in the thing. Yeah, no, I thought you hadn't seen it, you were just referencing, but yeah, true. No, I don't I know why I remember that the, as well. I saw the sequel, too. That's one that's I remember going, course, having fun with those. I remember them being fun. Isn't Anthony Hopkins in it as well? And it's a bunch of old people, right? Yeah, it's that a bunch sounds of like old, it could be yeah. really cool. Like, you get a bunch, it's like of, a bunch old, of old, prestigious yeah, actors and, 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 and killers. An movie. Kind of and what they're, they're designated is. red. Yeah, they're, they're retired right. and extremely dangerous. Don't fuck around with them. Just let them be. But the plot is they don't just let them be. Yeah, they're retired assassins, but they need to be killed because they're too dangerous to exist or whatever. Well, I'm going to be honest, I don't remember the plot at all <laughs> about the Cause movie. Because I, I was just about to say, like, God, movies. that's retarded, isn't it? Like, they're so dangerous, we need to kill them. <laughs> like, well, that might cause an issue. I don't know. They might kill you. I might not oh, like yeah. the idea of that, you know? That they might, might not be on board, is what you're them. saying, yeah? yeah? See, that's why we need the Looper universe, where you kill yourself to make sure you close your loop. That was clever, wasn't it? Destiny, yeah. you, you really like Looper, don't you? You think He's that's not there. Ah, uh, well, <laughs> we just have to. Well, you tab that discussion for another He's time. Closed, it's all good. It? You know, Can't Knives Out Two is coming out real soon, like in a month oh, or so. Oh, probably. I'm pretty sure Desi likes Knives oh, Out boy. as well. The poor I, guy. Yeah, I, think so. I wonder if they're gonna hey, have look, a character maybe... who just vomits whenever a lie is told around her. That could man, be this one also has a really great cast. It's like, man, just all of these actors that you get access to. Yeah, the, the that's Ryan Johnson. He has so many resources, and look what he does with them. Hey, maybe this one will be really cool. Who knows? I'm sure it will be. Octopus in Spider-Man 2. I really liked Alfred Molina's performance in Red. So now, whenever I look at those particular paintings, there's a part of me that feels happy. Because I'm like, oh yeah, Alfred Molina. There's a huge amount of input and, and, a, and a whole new vibe, really. My feelings are caused okay. by that specific right. painting, and they don't seem relevant to its meaning. But then we are right back where we started. It really seems like the artwork has a correct meaning that determines whether or not I get it. And you might be like, well, OK. I don't know if that's, um, I guess um, I... like, what? I, I, I guess I'm curious, like, maybe if we took a less, uh, I guess, extravagant example, like the Alfred Molina Spider-Man 2 thing. Like, if you looked at a painting uh, and it evoked a feeling of sadness, even though, I guess, like, the surface level reading would be, oh, but look, it's like a bright sunny day and there's all these people out in the, in the park having a great day. And that makes you really sad because of, I don't know, like... My you, wife you just, was murdered in a park on a bright sunny well, day. You know, we, we, I mean, you could have that or like maybe like, oh, yeah, I used to go to the park with my family as a kid, but we've all grown so far apart. And like, I guess you could look at that feeling and most other people look at it and they're happy and you're not. I don't know that you could say to that person, ah, see, you've uh, you misunderstood or like you're, you're the feeling that you've uh, projected onto this painting is um, misplaced. Or like not part of the original intent either that's visible from 
what is on the paint, you know, what is the painting or what the uh, the artist said about it. I don't so, know that it, it's a good idea to just dismiss that as like being... we talked about before, right? The, there's almost two kinds of meaning. The one you're drawing out because of all your personal life experiences and what these individual pieces of sensory data can uh, do, because like that's still a thing that is happening within you, whatever. But then there's the meaning of how you draw from what is actually there, I guess. I guess it's just a, a huge part of what art does when it comes to speaking to you personally is um, appealing to, to some extent, almost necessarily, your past experiences. Um, like one of the big one of the big strengths of storytelling is like a thing that we have as human beings is that it's a really fast track to empathy, to to creating a scenario where you could like explore a certain topic. Um, and then you can, through like POV characters or just POV in general, leveraging that POV, you can fast track the reader into understanding that experience, empathizing with it, maybe learning something from it. Um, like that's a part of it. Like your, your experience fitting into it is, is, um, is an almost inescapable component of, uh, of like any art ever, because anything that you look at, you're always bringing your eyes and your brain and your, and you know, consequently your life experiences and perspectives are going to be part of it. Um, and, and you can recognize things like, like you could use the example of the, the sunny day, you know, and be like, yeah, I, I know what this is supposed to make. No, I, I get it. I know what they're trying to get me to feel or want me to, to get me to feel like I recognize that and I just don't feel it. It's not even necessary yeah. a lack of understanding. It's just I like I know what you're trying. To, I mean, that happens with movies all the time when we watch them. We get what they're trying to say. We either don't agree or we recognize how poorly that idea was put across. Oh, so we can't really sympathize with it recognize that it's done very well but it's just not doing much for you yeah both uh, yeah, I, yeah i guess what i'm wondering here is it seems like the conclusion that's being drawn from this discussion is um let's say that i have a feeling that comes up in relation to a piece of art that i can pretty easily identify as being tethered to something that would be well beyond the scope of what the artist intended um that's wrong or maybe that's wrong uh I'm not sure how I feel about that, I guess. Oh, we, so what like, we said before, we just go back to, like, how do they connect it? Or is it just completely out of thin air? Which, mm. I don't know, it just seems like we've all decided, kind of, that, like, <laughs> that's that's how we just define whether or not it's valid, even though... Right. Could not necessarily be fair, right? Because if I just said there's a character that has the same name as, like, a grandparent who died, and that's it, it evokes all that for me. It's like, nobody's taking that away from me. It's kind of impossible. Mm-hmm. And it would still be referred to as meaning. Yeah, what did right. Rothko feel? He probably wasn't feeling anything to do with Alfred Molina or my ex-girlfriend. Probably. But the despair, the sadness, the trappedness. Yeah, maybe. I mean, he did say that he felt those things when he wrote about the paintings, so maybe that's it. Maybe if I stand in front of them and ah, I see, feel but you the see, same that's thing, the thing that like, could, now could we dive to that? That was how we felt when he wrote about it, which itself is another type of artistic expression, a different medium of artistic expression at a different time. How much should we read into, hmm, maybe he felt trapped, like, or maybe that was the feeling that he had while talking about his own piece because of a whole bunch of other reasons that are going to be difficult for us to... It's kind of the problem here. To some extent, we are trying to do a little bit of mind reading um, when it comes yeah. to the like, storial intent, um, it's tough. Thing that the, the artist end, felt wait, does the author's thing. intent matter? Well, so that's the part that I if guess you're trying is, to is, align um, what we're it. running through now. Uh, yeah. like the reason why I brought that up is because she's talking about he felt like he was trapped while writing about making, uh, or, or while writing about uh, the art piece. Mm -hmm. I think that that might be, I think that you could argue that that is different from the feeling that he may well have had while painting it, or even the feeling that he had while conceiving it, which I guess we covered in part one anyway, right? Like the, you know, over the course of the creation of something. I guess that's what I'm saying is like, I would, I think that all of these things kind of um, crystallize why it's probably better to try uh, to minimize how much you're relying on what the creator says and try to focus as much as you can uh, on what it is. And here's like a the reference to the material in it. Yeah, here's a question. Mm -hmm. uh, if Tolkien came out and he gave some statements about Lord of the Rings, it wasn't explicitly like written in the book, would you consider his statements canon? No. Uh, wait, what? If Tolkien came out mm -hmm. and he made some statements about what happened in 
the Samarillion oh, or like Lord of the Rings. Would you consider those statements events. canon? Okay. Yeah. The actual events. Uh, Let's say Tolkien the, says I that the, uh, the, Frodo the, 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 was actually in kind of... love with Gandalf. He had a secret love for him. I think that it's um it's it's uh it's complicated when it comes to like if there's stuff that isn't in the story and then the author comes out and says these are things that happen that like weren't in the story that happened at a different time or in a different place um I'm not I, I don't know cuz canon is kind of like canon is determined by the creator or, or, or at the very least like the person who owns the story I never you know? would have guessed that's your argument for me, ever I don't know I feel like you're not even freeing right now. Who, are you, who, are, who I'm are you? I'm trying to. Well, I'm trying to. What? So it, it ultimately, like, I need references that exist within the material to start to figure out, like, whether or not I agree. Well, okay. Was... So in the case of Dumbledore is gay from J.K., where it's just, she hasn't got. Fuck, that's where I was going. Fuck Dumbledore. you. I tried to bait you with Tolkien first, <laughs> I got but that's exactly... you back this time. <laughs> yeah, that's where yeah. I was going next. <laughs> Though this is like Sam disappears for uh, five seconds during a scene, and then Tolkien is asked, "Where did he go during that scene?" He goes, "He went off for a piece." Like, I guess we can. Uh, yeah, you could, you could think that's what happened. We we don't know. Whatever. But it's something like, no, it is canon that he peed because he just said it in an interview. It's like, no, that's not how that works. No, no. And I'm pretty sure that's your position as well. I've never heard you say like, "Oh yeah, um, maybe." I guess like, uh... maybe the distinction is whether or not wanna... it's contradictory or supplementary. I don't even think that. Uh, well, I, just... I mean, from Fringy, I mean, like in terms of what Fringy might have been thinking. Well, at the time. I guess um, I'm trying to because because when we're talking about like events that happen, um, like if 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 you were if you had a story that I don't know begins in like our. I don't know, like 10 p.m. or something. That's when the story begins. And then the author says, yeah, at 9 p.m., like, I don't know, Bill, the main character, brushed his teeth. Like, what, like, would that be something, like, how would we interpret that as, as like, whether or not that is canon? If he said, yeah, oh, it's, it's teeth simple. It's not canon. You can imagine that may have happened. Right. As, as long as we're appealing to stuff that is beyond any. Uh, yeah, like I don't know why this story. would even be thought about. It's like you're going to think... destroy the meaning of canon at this point if it's any whim I'm... the writer has in interviews and stuff. What I guess about I'm trying to like throw it away with um like external text, right? Like if, like if you have a law book for for like, a law book is different because it's been that's art that's been brought into the world now. Now you right, reference. So... But here's a question: what if something... That's a part of canon at that point. What if there's something yeah, ambiguous? Is... Okay, okay, right. Yeah. What if there's something ambiguous in the medium, and then later on. Um, the person provides clarification. What if Nolan came out and he told you that um, at the end of Inception, it does spin forever? Would you consider that to be valid? That it does? No. That that's canon now? No. Nope. Nope. He doesn't get to decide because in his movie, he left it ambiguous. Yeah. This like is, this is, is Han Shaw yeah. uh, This is At the end Han of the day, when it comes to figuring out what happens in a story, basically all that you have ultimately is what is in the story. Like, because it, because what if you know, like if the writer says, "Well, this was what I was thinking of doing before, but then I changed my mind and left it out." It's like, well, you left it out, like you left it out of the story. So now, whether or not it happened is, I have nothing to, like what? I guess um, if we had the hypothetical, what happens if um, I don't know, like the the author somehow just like forgets, totally forgets, like some the the story that they've written, and it's impossible for them to like screw it away. Some crazy amnesia. And then they start laying out a list of things that happened that didn't exist in the story. It's like, is that legitimate? Like, at the end what, of the sorry, day... Sorry, what what's the format for them doing this? Like an interview or another book? Maybe like, a, uh, yeah, maybe an interview. I don't know. They have some like weird amnesia. And then the first thing they get out of the hospital, they have like a fundamentally different understanding of the sequence of events in their own story. Yeah, and I mean, then they give an just interview like... where they say... That's that's pretty much the purpose of death of the author at this point. Is be like that's nice that they have that well, interpretation. Yeah, I, I guess that's I guess that's the point, right? If they'd said it in an interview, then it's like okay, whatever. But then if they wrote it down, it's like well, now you've contradicted. Like yeah, now it's just plot holes. In your, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that basically squares it away. You got to be referencing what's in the story, like first and foremost. But um, yeah, I, I think Han shot first is like the one that sums this up the best. Like, did George decide or did we decide after seeing yeah, the story play out? Uh, Han shot first. Yes, he did. <laughs> like this. I guess it's, well, I guess, I guess the reason why when we're talking about the nature of canon, maybe this is why I was getting my wires crossed. Like, when it comes to Star Wars, what is canon now? It's like, well, the sequel trilogy is canon, as defined by, like, the people who own it. Um, the meaningful definition of canon it is, yeah. Well, I guess that's the thing, right? Canon versus uh, continuity, maybe? Maybe that's a distinction without a difference, though? Or, or maybe that's what we need, right? Like, continuity versus, I, I don't know. 
Well, you, um, I mean, pe people will sometimes go the whole route of like, I, you know, canon to me is whatever I consider. And, and I don't even think that's necessarily invalid. I just don't know that there's much we can do with that versus, you know, if, like IP licensing and owning it. That seems to be the best way we can have a meaningful definition that goes beyond whatever we like out of all the stories. Well, because um, if, if we don't do that, things start to become incongruent. Like, imagine if you said, yeah, you know, like, uh, a New Hope and, and Return of the Jedi are uh, canon, but Empire Strikes Back is non-canon. It's like, wait, what the fuck? Like, what, what's happened now? Like, this story is Yeah, even in their different. own their own world was starting to fall apart, yeah. Exactly. Especially if they liked, you know, what comes after the sequels, but they didn't like the sequels, and so they said the sequels aren't canon, but, you know, fucking Mando is. Also, wait, when does Mando take place again? That's post sequels uh, right now. Uh, before uh, sequels. Yeah. It's, the, um, it's before sequels. After. Right, right, right. It's in between uh, six. And okay, seven. but let's just say let's just say this person liked Rise of Skywalker, and they're like, "That's canon," but the other two aren't. You'd be like, "Oh, all right." Well, you've we got your it. foot in the door to have a discussion with us, then. That means I've got it. But hang on a minute. We've already tried this. Remember a minute ago, we learned about how the artist's intention can be a tricky concept because intentions change over time and the artist themselves might be just another interpretation. How do I know I'm not doing the same thing with Rothko's feelings? Well, I think, I think the difference is you're trying to understand their intentions. It, 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 if your goal is to do something that's very difficult to do, then yeah, this is what's going to happen if you're trying to learn something that isn't so hard and rigidly defined, like the intentions of someone that can change over time. Whereas the thing might stay the same and remain as it is. You're, you're kind of chasing something that's a bit more ambiguous and amorphic, um, amorphous, sorry. Um, so that's why, while it can be very interesting to get those intentions and it can have a lot of explanatory power as to why things are the way they are in a, in, in a, in any creation. Um, yeah you can't always rely on those things being available, even if the artist is alive or not, or even if they recorded, supposedly recorded all their thoughts. Uh, someone's just asked me, how, like, how have you gotten to the point where you're saying like Tolkien's words wouldn't be canon, but what, Amazon, because they have the license, they're allowed to dictate canon? Like, yes, uh, it sucks. But if you want to do it the reverse, where only Tolkien, Tolkien, to Tolkien can make the canon, and that everyone else is not because they're not him. You can do it that way. That can be how you define what the canon is. Well, the, uh, the other example would be George Lucas is the only one who gets to say what yeah. Star Wars canon, even though Disney's making all the movies and they're the only people who can make the merchandise. Well, yeah, like, what does that. it even mean at this point to say what is and isn't canon when, like, yeah. one entity has total control over the stories that will be getting you, created at this point? Yeah. You still and get can the problems. You sell like, that ability. You still get the problem with like Ridley Scott, where it's like he is the only one that can define what happens in the Alien franchise. And then you're like, oh, well, now it means we lose aliens, <laughs> and then we gain Prometheus and Alien Covenant. It's like, yay. Well, the interesting mm -hmm. thing too is that um, is it the is it Euthyphro? How do you pronounce this guy's name? Euthyphro. Euthyphro dilemma. Yeah. The um, is something moral because God says it, or does God say it because it's moral? Um, you run into a very interesting thing that's akin to that. What if we say, um, what if we grant, okay, well, if the author says it, it's canon, what if the author begins to speak a bunch of, like, contradictory stuff? How do you deal with that? Let's say that, um, let's say that J.K. Rowling comes out and she says Hermione um, was actually, like, a 12-foot-tall giant who was actually quite stupid. Like, what do we... Intellectual giant. Yeah. Well, no, stupid, a dumb giant. What do we say with that? It's oh, no! Totally well, incongruent I was gonna say, with everything uh, in, the, in, the, in the previous well, writing. Well, essentially... So. Well, well, this problem comes in because in the real world, you can't have plot holes. And so we're trying to make sense of things that just don't like they physically don't make sense within a world like a fictitious world can have these problems when a real one can't. So how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, I was going to say the, how do you make sense an even more difficult question than she says in an interview and it contradicts what she's done in her books would be that she actually has these facts in both books. Like there's two books and they just describe something and those two things can't be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you can go with interpretations of individual characters if there's a narrator or something. But if it's as, as, as cut and dry as two things that literally just couldn't take place uh, at the same time, then mm -hmm. you probably go for the one that happened first in the timeline. Sure, if they happen at the same time, 
You could say that the and, art uh, itself is like a lack of continuity or that they actually make mistakes. But I just think it's interesting that like, it seems like we intuitively want to say that, well, if the author speaks something, then that must be true. But it seems like that can only be the case if the art itself hasn't made a statement on that particular thing. So only in ambiguous parts. Because if the author said something that was clearly contradictory to the art, I think most of us would consider that the art supersedes whatever the original person says, right? Yes. Yeah. I think um, that's yeah. generally the way that it's going to... I mean, what is the point of, like, creating the artwork if not for the artwork mm -hmm. to stand on its own, regardless yeah. of your further input on it? And so far as the licensing goes, I think it's just a matter of what question should we uh, ask or answer, right? So when somebody's like, well, what if the IP sold to somebody, they do something way different with the art? The, the last three Star Wars movies are a really good example. Is Rey supposed to be the most important person in the universe, or is she just supposed to be an average person, and anybody can be really important if they try hard enough, right? The book, the all three movies, well, the, the first and the third have a different opinion than the second, because of the changing of directors, I think. Um, so yeah. uh, the question is, what's the right answer there? Well, or what would George Lucas have wanted? These are all different questions than, like, what does the canon of Star Wars say, right? Like, there's a different question of, like, what would George Lucas have done? Or what would George Lucas's Star Wars have said? Or what would um, whoever Ryan, the fucking name of the director. Ryan what, Johnson. Yeah, what would Ryan Johnson have said? These are all different questions than, like, what is Star Wars saying? Because if you ask, what is Star Wars saying? You say, well, George Lucas would say that. or Well, th those are fundamentally different questions that are being asked or answered there. Um, it would also present an issue as well when uh, the IP sort of runs out, as in like it becomes public. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do we define canon at that point? I don't actually have an yeah, answer to that right. question. Yeah, the answer would be different people's canons, right? It, well, I at that point, yeah, you kind of just have to choose. Yeah. I don't think we can have I mean, anything that's why more we distinct, than that. Well, we did, that's why we make a distinction between head canon and canon. Well, yeah, like, yeah, that's what I'm like, saying. We don't have canon necessarily anymore as a distinction once the, it becomes a public IP, right? Well, yeah, it's just you take each story as its own thing. And if you have like a sequel, a direct sequel to one of those stories, it's like, well, you got to take those together as well. Like if they, you know, connect to each other. But like, you're not going to compare The Wizard of Oz and the continuity of like Oz the Great and Powerful because like these are two different things. They are too Wait, did Disney make the... No, Disney didn't make the original, did they? Disney didn't exist yet. Ah, uh, whatever. Like, yeah. I think it was uh, MGM. <laughs> well, just look at... Yeah. The, yeah. the best example here is just look at uh, fan fiction. Like, we wouldn't say fan fiction is canon, but we could speak about fan fictions, right? Or different things. That, oh, yeah, 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 like yeah, yeah. It's its own internal thing, yeah. Well, I guess uh, an example, though, with, like, fan fiction is, is the stuff that's not included in that story, like, would you appeal to the existing, like, the, the actual official, you know, like, canon story to fill in the blanks? Yeah, because the, yeah, the cause reason it's like is a more fork. likely... The reason it's more likely to break down canon is because it's likely from the same person who created it, but even then, if it's not, it's the one that people are going to be more likely to be consuming. So it's like more ears and eyes will reach the discussion. But there are plenty of people who break down fan fictions of uh, particular IPs as well. Yeah, it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fan fictions are just like forks of like the original. So you'd assume that most things are the same unless they explicitly state otherwise, right? Yeah. I think yeah, that's it's the, building yeah, off a foundation, yeah. In Pale Fire, John Shade obviously felt a lot of things, but. How do we know whether or not Charles picked up on the right ones? In my play, there are like nine characters, some of whom feel things that I've never felt in real life. So what is the audience supposed to feel? I am Pablo Picasso's paintings. How do you feel about me? Here's an idea. Who gives a sh Cash Monet. Right. I am Salvatore Mundi by Leonardo the Big Dog Da Vinci. In 2017, I was bought by Saudi Arabian ruler Mohammed bin Salman for 450 million, 312,500 dollars, which makes me, oh my gosh, I guess that makes me the most valuable painting in the world. Who cares what art means? The most expensive painting ever sold. I was gonna say, why wouldn't you That's phrase different. it that way? Yeah, when you say the most I, valuable, I don't know how you're fucked up on this. But... You're a philosopher, <laughs> yeah. and you use that word that way. Stop. <laughs> Just... You're not good at your job. Oh, I guess because she is you're very successful. Yeah. Art means, <sighs> or what it's about, or how people feel. Not the art world. That's for sure. Salvatore Mundi is a portrait of Jesus, a man who famously did not have a high opinion of rich people. Get it. 
Yeah. Not but the best image did, to use to relay that, but... It didn't matter because art is what economists call an asset or in poor people language, it's a way to avoid paying taxes. Let me give you some advice, okay? This section is gonna be great. <laughs> this is now Salvatore's okay. business influencer tips. Buy cheap paintings. And when I say cheap, I mean like rich people cheap, like $25,000, there's nothing. Take those cheap paintings to an appraiser, one that you trust, and say, hey, Jimmy, how much would you say this painting is worth? And Jimmy goes, oh, I don't know, maybe a million dollars. And then what you do is donate that work of art to a charitable foundation, preferably one that you control. Oh, but Salvi, I hear you say, why am I giving it away? Why am I not selling it? Well, I, I hope this loops back into the meaninglessness of I was our... actually gonna say, I'm actually not just, sure how this is going to be like a yeah. pri the prism. I assume this time is just how expensive it is, is what how meaningful it is. But obviously, oh, no I one's thought gonna... this was just the I thought this is going to the bitching about capitalism. That's what we're leading into, like how yeah, but subvert the. Well, at the same like time, the point of view will likely be to include the the money people who are like the best painting is the one that people will pay the most money for, which you can get done instantly and dismiss. Like nobody really cares. Well, but it's a Transformers thing, isn't it? Oh yeah, the best thing yeah. ever made. The I was That's gonna funny, say right? this is a totally valid critique because I think a lot of people will say like, "Oh, well, like, what's the best song? Uh, Kanye West. Look how much you know, triple platinum, blah blah blah. Who's the best, whatever, blah blah blah. Oh, my superhero movies, highest grossing movie of all time. Like, who's the yeah. best director? James Cameron, obviously. Look at the grossing of the films. Like, I think people will will do these types of evaluations. How popular is their art? How much money does it make? Like, I'm not even sure. Like, I. I want to believe you believe that, but like, how many people would that they stand by that once you ask them just a couple of questions? Like, once you reflect on different industries, then you find the Transformers oh, argument okay. is why it was referenced that way. It's like nobody yeah. believes Transformers are amazing, but they did make a shit ton of money. If you step outside of internet the communities and talk to normies, I think normies would always cite how popular something is for how good it is. I think definitely. I've I talked to plenty of movies about think, movies, and I don't think that's true. I don't think so. Yeah, I think most people are able to recognize that. I, I find, do believe like, people will make appeals to popularity and success to justify their positions, but it's like but it'll crumble in seconds. Them. Like yeah, like you just ask them about a thing that they like that isn't very. Wait, popular. I don't. To the I point don't where they don't even believe like, it, they just might. Yeah, I don't even mean they... in a debate format. I mean, you just ask them to apply that to other things, and then they'll be like, "Well, no, not that, because that's bad." And you're like, "Right?" And they'll okay, be like, so. "Oh yeah, you're right. I I I really mean da da da." There's something you, deeper. You are, that. Yeah, you're correct. People on the internet still appeal. Like, right now, people are like, Rings of Power is better than House of the Dragon because it is getting more viewership. And then other people are like, well, no, it's not. The viewership's going up for House of the Dragon. And I'm, you know, we're sitting here like, the fucking viewership doesn't, that, that's not, doesn't tell stop us talking about that. <laughs> I mean, it's important in terms of Amazon staking a lot on Rings of Power to be successful. So there's still a conversation to be had, of course. I just mean that, I don't know. You can bring this up. I just don't know that you should spend much time on this this perspective because I just don't know how long it's going to last. It's not going to be much of a like the more money it, it's worth, the better of more meaningful it is. Just like mm, sure, but I can't, you know. I can't remember anyone making this argument. I'm sure they're out there. Well, but, no, yeah, the, so I would say that the common configuration of this argument is like, well, yeah, you say that's bad, but look at all these people who like it. I, I often that's I've heard that plenty of times. Well, see, but that's like, a different uh, argument. Uh. Yeah, I suppose you could say, well, I guess they'd be appealing to the popular, like, you know, people would say, well, yeah, but who cares what you think? They're making, like, fact, all this money, so clearly, you know. I actually think that's a much stronger argument than this one, uh, to talk about what common, people in the world yeah. find to be most meaningful collectively is a much better way of trying to categorize art than which one was sold for the most money. Uh, yeah, I guess I'd say that there can be some level of blurriness or conflation between those two types of arguments. Yeah. Like making appeals ultimately to things that are beyond the material. Uh, Which is interesting, right? Because like Transformers made all that money, but there's like nobody defending it. It's like, oh, oh, I mean, Avatar okay. is an interesting example. A lot of people talk about it. How many people could tell you anything about that film? How many people could tell you the name of the main character? Jake. Was it Jake? Oh my it, God. Jake Sully. Yeah, it is Jake Sully. See, I remember. Ah, I'm actually yeah. surprised I got that right. <laughs> I can't remember why I know I that. I don't know why I know that. Yeah, what the fuck? As Jake Sully, there was of course Natiri. You had it was Quaritch was uh, Stephen Lang's I, character. I don't know any of these other names. <laughs> Grace, uh, look, I, well, I mean, this I remember more about Avatar, evidently, than uh, than most people do. The world than James Cameron. 
but, but oh, he I, loves it. He's very he, loves, he does love it. This is a work of passion for him. Which, you know what? The fact that he really likes Avatar makes me wonder if Avatar 2 might be, like, really worthwhile. <laughs> maybe. For, uh, maybe. 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 I think we'll give it a shot. Why not? I mean, everybody chance. will. Yeah. Well, because as far as the tax collectors are concerned, you just donated a million dollars to charity, my friend. You're practically a saint. So use it for clout. And more importantly, it's a tax write-off. Or try it this way around. Let's say you already own a painting and it's very valuable. Like me, but not me, obviously. You couldn't afford me. <laughs> I'm Jesus Christ Superstar. Take that valuable painting to your appraiser and say, hey, Jimmy, how much would you say this one is worth? And Jimmy says, oh, I don't know. Not much, I reckon. Then what you do is you die. The method is up to you there. But when you go, donate that valuable painting to your spoilt rich kids, to Ferdinand and Jemima and Armancio. They then sell it. And oh, wouldn't you know it, it's actually worth loads of money now. But by that point, they've already avoided inheritance tax. Boom. You can look down proudly from heaven where rich people definitely go. The art market. Okay. Like it, it's, um, okay. we're just waiting for points about art to come up. <laughs> we're getting there, I'm sure. It's pretty unregulated, pretty opaque, and very concentrated. And if you have the millions it takes to buy in, there are millions of ways you can stack the deck. Whilst the plebs are standing in front of the work trying to figure out what it means, you already know what it means. It means you never have to work again! Huge vibe. Except, well, it's hard to be completely cynical. Even in the ritziest of ritzy art circles, people do still talk about the meaning. In the early noughties, a new art movement developed that came to be known as zombie formalism. Pretty quickly, people started to suspect that zombie formalism was just trying to make a quick buck. A lot of the paintings themselves were pretty visually neutral. So you could hang them in a CEO's office or a fancy lobby and they'd so take I'm up guessing. space that where we're heading here is like, what does it look like when the, I guess, the economic side of art creation filters into the, the process itself? Which Presumably, is like, yeah. that's, that's a topic that's worthwhile, right? Like if you look at a lot of mainstream films, how do standards or like expectations about what the audience want uh, alter whenever you're creating in an adverse way, like mandatory action scenes or like a love triangle because that's what you're meant to do in certain yeah, or like, romance. Or... Even just when someone's critical of anything about it, and it's like, to be fair, their budget was X Y Z, and it's like, should that be oh, factored in? Right, like, what would the means available to them, and, and does that, uh... like, for instance, if a developer's like, yeah, we couldn't, you know, we had a deadline, so we couldn't fix all the bugs. It's like, cool, bro. <laughs> you know, bugs, nevertheless, yeah. Yeah. nevertheless, um, this is a problem. Yeah, is like, that, how much? It, is Cyberpunk in a working condition? Has anyone checked? Is that oh, like a loved game now? Much played by over a hundred thousand i think it's because of the anime it's now it's, like a hundred thousand current players on steam i think when we covered it we were like it's gonna need a no man's sky story and i'm guessing it's getting there is it? no shot i have no idea it. what the state of the game is i don't believe i have, well, no, I have no clue well i mean it's if a hundred i'm pretty sure that there are the the concurrent play account for cyberpunk 2077 is higher than it ever was for the witcher 3 right now um yeah okay so, Handing out, and I think it's the uh, the Edge Runners like anime on Netflix. Like that's hilarious. Like... Um, you know, well, I, I, want, I really want to know how many players were added to League of Legends from Arcane. Not that there's a way to figure that out, but it'd be it'd be neat to know. Uh, that would be interesting. Um, that would be interesting. Who knows though? Without pulling too much. I actually focus. get an answer for you them... really quick on the player count numbers. So um, the this is for Steam though. This is going to my Steam charts. The all-time peak players for The Witcher 3 was 103,000. Cyberpunk today had 121,600 players. Yeah, so With it's... an all-time it, peak of 830,000. Oh, that um, would have been so, I think. You have um, an all-time valley for 2077. He just said it was like... Eight, oh, the, the valley the, the lowest it got. 
the lowest it got. I can, what I can do is there. There's a chart here that shows the the gain in percentage gain in average players month by month. It looks I'm like curious the how low lowest, it got before it climbed back up. You know, the lowest average player count for Cyberpunk 2077 was in October of 2021. It was only 8,000 players. Well, only that's not bad compared to some other yeah. games. With the scale of this game, that's well true. That's true because CD yeah, Project, obviously the context. Yeah, see, that was like one of the most yeah. hyped. Just happens, man. When the game gets really hyped up, so no, often. it's not because it was hyped up. It's because it was dog shit. Or there were a lot of glitches. Well, no, 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 no. What what I mean I is that understand. we often see what what we often see is that a game will get really hyped up to the point that like critical, like a critical eye on something like just kind of gets lost in like the promise of the concept like no man's sky was an example that game was super hyped up um so much so that I, i'm pretty sure total biscuit even like before that came out was talking like i'm not sure that i see like this this game being what people think it will be or something along those well lines. even so i think the issue is that it's not just that it was overhyped it was that the developers actually lied they over promised hard they were they were over promising uh, yeah, and under delivering it's true yeah um, and I mean, it was the same for City Project Red with Cyberpunk. I guess what I'm saying is that we have like these examples of these games that were super hyped up, high profile, and then they came out and they were massive disappointments. Like, well, uh, um... I, I think um, the reason why I'm thinking that was Cyberpunk is because when that game came out, one of the conditions for the reviews for that game, I believe, was that they couldn't use any of their own captured footage. There was like a set amount of footage that uh they had access to so, yeah. um and they couldn't yeah and so like that wasn't happened. it a console as well because uh, oh, the pc yeah, one was running PC, way worse they only i think it was that no the console ones were dog shit so they i think oh, it was, it was only okay. pc reviews no ps4 these are all massive red flags that yes there been, were many uh, many red flags before that game actually released just, to the public it never, it never came about like a lot of people glossed aside and like didn't really think about that i guess what i mean is that we see this where like a game gets so hyped up that pretty clear warnings that something is wrong just get overlooked. It's like, oh, well, City Project Red, they're awesome. Like they made The Witcher three, so you know oh, it'll, sure, be, it'll be cool. Destiny as well, right? Not you, Destiny. Yeah, the chill. game Destiny. <laughs> like Who that was a game. Name a girl's name based. Well, you predate Destiny, the game, right? Yeah, those fuckers murdered my SEO. Wow. It's actually hard to ask. Yeah, that must have been a fucking nightmare when that came out in terms of like, oh, great, that's going to fuck with people searching for me forever now. Yeah, except now I benefit because fuck them. People search for the game yeah, they, they get me. You've managed to outlast Destiny as an IP. So well, I don't know. That's true. I think it's still going, right? It is still going, but... Destiny I, the Streamer is a 10-year project. I'm kind of, sure that, uh, I wonder which gets more engagement, especially with your last few weeks. I thought, like, isn't Destiny 2 doing, like, because uh, PlayStation bought Bungie for, like, $3 billion. Um, so, like, I'm pretty sure Destiny's in a competition of which Destiny is uh, is is doing well. I guess it's hard to say. I'm it's pretty sure the movie. Destiny game is doing far, far, far better than I am. That's, I'm pretty sure it's oh. still a pretty... I don't think the Why? game has died at all. <laughs> How many people are watching Destiny 2 on Twitch versus watching Destiny right now? I don't I know, but like, how, how do you find? People are playing Destiny right now. Yeah, tell Destiny me how many... Two. How many people are playing Destiny on... Two right now? Right now that, on Steam, Destiny oh, 12, Two. Uh, twice as many. Damn. Des Destiny Two today on Steam had a hundred and seven thousand four hundred. Okay, okay, so stars. close, close. All right, pretty, pretty close. Good, yeah, like they're doing pretty well. <laughs> close. Yeah, we'll get there. It's almost there. We'll yeah. get there. Okay. Apparently, I guess that game also got a whole lot of work done to it, much like Cyberpunk. And well, it's an MMO, right? Really it's like ongoing, updated lame. shit, right? I, it, I'm, I'm not gonna call that game an MMO. Games uh, well, is it's a like, service. It's like it, the the most watered down an MMO can be. I feel with it like, being um, technically like an MMO, but like no one's like, oh yeah, I I need an MMO to play. You should play Destiny too. I don't know if that's what people oh, mean sure, when like they say it's, that. It was kind of the era of like the division where there were these like sort of that were trying to bridge the gap between, I guess, conventional PvP multiplayer stuff on consoles and like like these sort of shared worlds that were like kind of there were other people around and you could kind of interact yeah. with them but like yeah yeah um, it's distinct I, from you know, the world of warcraft and the guild wars stuff i i imagine that destiny 2 is probably like really fun now if you've been in, immersed in it and engaged with it but yeah when that game came out that was that was uh, it was pretty darn mediocre so I nice. Dude, that's, that's one of those um that's one of those games yeah. i know nothing about but i watched several people review it i don't know why i just it, i remember it being fun
Well, I uh, I got really hyped for the first one because it's like, oh, Bungie's new thing after Halo. That's going to be really exciting. And I think I think at this point, it's basically all but confirmed that something happened during development. There were like big changes that happened where the story was changed uh, pretty drastically because like the game as it came out barely had one. Certain locations were removed or placed at different points in the game. I think there was an interview where the developer said you could go to Saturn. But you can only go to Saturn after the Taken King DLC came out a year later and 40 bucks. Um, something happened. Something happened at Bungie. Something happened with that game. Um, yeah. I mean, that, that should be one of those reminders that when it comes to... I think that we can really easily... It's like, oh, that's, you know, we talk about Naughty Dog or Bungie or, um, or City Project Red. It's like these studios... And kind of forget that it's like, well, it's the people who are in these studios who do come and go, who, like, make the games yep. at the end of the Bioware. day. Bioware. The Bungie that existed in 2006 or 7 is very different from the Bungie that exists now in 2022. Same goes for Bioware. CD Projekt Red is now, like, a massive publicly traded company, like, in Poland. Like, it, it just changes, and it's, it's um, I don't know, the, the, the company that makes the game, like, 10 or 15 years ago... It's just not, it invariably not going to be the same company that makes it in the future. Just something to keep in mind, I guess. Somebody asked, um, was there any chance of you suing them for using the word destiny? But I don't think you can take <laughs> no, ownership on the a word trademark? destiny. Yeah. <laughs> not no. Candy Crush? Like, didn't didn't they want to trademark the word candy? Wasn't that a thing that happened? Jeez. Like, wow. That's like the React well, shit, isn't it? I it as well, I think. I, I can't remember if it ever, I, I'm pretty sure it didn't pan out, but I remember thing reading is. about that. The one thing about it, because I remember figuring find out this from Better Call Soul of all things, um, is it if someone started up a stream and they relied on your SEO and used a lot of things that were similar but not the same as your stuff and called themselves Destiny, would you then have a case? Probably. Being, it would like, probably depend to... on the level of similarities. I don't know. There's like a yeah. auto copyright for like likeness or whatever, so it would just depend. Pushed boundaries, but in ways that didn't always seem significant. Like, oh, it's the first painting ever to be done with a fire extinguisher. Great. And- That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> with a fire extinguisher? A I, mean, I guess, well, I mean, like, it's kind of fair, this is This that, is the character that likes money, right? I think that's the point. That's I guess here. it is interesting to Denny, because I mean, there's always a first, right? Snow White was the first theatrical animated film. And I guess you could be like, oh, that's a gimmick. It's like, well, <laughs> like, you yes, know, it like, it, uh, don't do that. Don't say it's such things. Them got flipped. Bought cheap first time round, sold very expensive on the secondary market. These examples are the Seven Rain paintings by Lucian Smith, one of the most prominent zombie formalists, and they made him very rich. When they were exhibited in LA, they were accompanied by this description. Smith's work acts as a tangible moment, a chronicle of exploration as he negotiates with existence. He reminds us that an artist should drop. I feel like this is you with the red brick, the red squares. I'm not, I'm lost now no. as to whether or not this is the, um, the character. Like the character being... or. Yeah, I'm I not sure. I'm... Is this meant to be, because I thought the whole point of this particular movement was kind of like cynically tapping in, in into uh, into like, you know, like art as a as a commercial sector. Yeah, that's like, what I thought. And, and yeah. so in this case, there's something that was Jeez. created cynically that is still somebody looked at it and like had all of these meanings that they, they I pulled from it. It's all the difference. So this, well, I, so this I is her making fun part. of this reviewer of that work. I assume that, that's what I'm getting from this. I am. I am yet to decide. I was gonna wait for more context clues. Yeah. Well, you, well, Waller, do you think that that statement I, is I being mocked to the No, anymore? I don't. It's not that. It's I don't know from what POV that's happening. Is it right. philosophy tubes, or is it the character philosophy tube is playing, or is it a commentary on that cynical approach from that artist? Uh, those, those paintings, yeah. Okay. That's fine with me. I, mean, I was just going to say, I was a little bit confused. Remember what that said? Those words just slid off my brain. That that was pure bullshit. And yeah, a lot of philosophers and art critics actually said that at the time. Or words to that effect. Interestingly, okay. Lucian Smith himself has since come forward and kind of admitted it. The model that was set... Well, that doesn't matter though, right? What If, if that's what people yeah, take away from that piece... We, yeah, we... we 
th that's why I say I think this is this seems really weird considering what you said about the red square. Like how well, come it's she's valid? A, I think it's just different. I don't think she's has made a statement of what her personal feelings are yet, right? I think these are all yeah. Like I think that the format of this video is she's presenting like th different frameworks that can be used to figure out what the meaning of art is. So we had the first one what the author intended second one it's like how does it make you feel and then this is the third one monetary like what happens when the monetary factor is um so she does represent she's the, referencing the money in i thought she was actually saying in that moment that this because she knew this was bullshit and they were doing that to be bullshit and so she's criticizing it on that format oh, i and think that's I, what she's doing now yeah and what i was going to say is like well even if say for example i provide an interpretation of a film and then I was like, hee hee hee, I only said all that to be trolly and stuff, but everyone found it to be incredibly meaningful. It's like, it's kind of evolved past me at that point, isn't it? it? I mean, that's, yeah, like, you can create something, I mean, imagine, like, yeah, like, some guy is like, hey, you gotta write a book, there's part of your contract, like, for your multi-book deal or something, and it's like, ah, I'm not inspired, it's like, well, that's the deal, figure it out. And he's like, ah, whatever, I'm just pump out and throw out this crappy thing. And then he throws it out and everybody's like, wow, this is like your greatest work. You know, this is your finest creation. What does it matter if he's like, yeah, but I didn't care. I was so cynical. I just like wrote it in a week and threw oh, it out. That's Nobody like Thor Ragnarok. Like, not Thor Ragnarok, uh, Love and Thunder. Thor Love and Thunder, Gosh. yeah. Yeah, if someone said, but, okay, that's your greatest artwork of all time, you'd probably be like, <laughs> yeah, great. How depressing that would be if that was yeah. the thing that he had the most. Like, yeah, Jojo Rabbit was like, that was, yeah, but like, Thor Love and Thunder, uh, man. Up to you. For me, when I was younger, it wasn't a healthy model. It was about sucking up to collectors and trying to sell for the highest prices. That stuff isn't real. That's not art. According to his website, Smith is now living in New York, making NFTs for a company called Lobus, which... I mean, if somebody had accused me of making worthless art just so that it could be sold to fools to make a lot of money, I, I, I probably wouldn't get into crypto, man. But even at its most cynical, people still had to act like the art had meaning. Part of the well, process- Oh, wait, that, so that's the problem. Were they acting? Maybe some of them were, but some of them might have genuinely, like, it might have- well, No, it sounds like they're saying they acted because it was for a tax scheme, is what they're- is what she's arguing about. Uh, well, that's like cool. people, <laughs> that everybody like, around them all had to act like it was worth something, otherwise they get like exposed for a tax fraud or something. Oh, right, I see. Like you have to, you have to at least perform that this is art, so that you know people treat it as art rather than like a means of avoiding tax. I just yeah. like the idea that there's that one guy who's like, I do think it's good though, and they're all like, like yes, good. yes, yes, good, yeah. yes. And they're like, no, 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 seriously, I do. Yes, <laughs> we like, yes, yes, that's what I'm getting at. Surely in the discussion there has to be some recognition that some of the people who are these high rollers buying these expensive artworks are in it for like genuine reasons. It's just like, yeah, I really like art and I got the means to access it. And, like I like appraising art and, and being able to have it, own it, do stuff with it. Hmm. It's not weird things. So I, I was just it. thinking about, I don't know, my mind's gone nuts with the whole like, when you provide an interpretation, does it have death of the author applied to it too? Like you've got the source and then you talk about what you think it means and then someone takes that and then you go, what I meant by that was this and they go, no, I'm taking it for whatever I think it means now. I guess if you write an essay, like a book report on a book and then you, you publish it and then somebody takes that, yeah, I guess there would be death of the author in terms yeah. of your communication of that idea. It's just, it just keeps yeah, going. The author of the Mobius strip, I guess. Terrifying. Keeps... Of building hype around a new artist is convincing people that their work has something interesting to say. And zombie formalism didn't last in part because audiences and critics saw through it. Other trends mm. took its place, okay, including right. a trend for what you might call... And people video not... through Marvel. Gosh. Eh. I watched mm. a video similar to this concept that had to deal with, um, with it, it was Carl Jobst, I think is his name. He, maybe it's Jobster, I don't know. But he, um, he did one on like retro games and that there was a whole essentially fake BS market behind appraisals and this sort of thing. But instead of uh, like paintings and stuff, there's a, it's like retro me, collectible gaming stuff. You make me think of the comic book crash because that was in part. Exactly that too. Yeah, yeah. Like, because of their perceived future value like everybody wanted their action comics uh 
Wait, ah, oh, damn it. They wanted their Detective Comics number one or Action Comics one or like Amazing Fantasy 13, I think it was for Spider Man. Uh, like, they wanted that. But then the problem is that you get X Force one and five million people bought it. It's just never gonna, it's never gonna appreciate to that. Like, people were in it more so for like trying to make money off of, you know, selling comic books rather than just participating and reading comic books. And that mm -hmm. part, you know, it's like an unsustainable market. At the end of the day, like, people need to be engaged with the work and interested in it. Otherwise, it kind of can't support itself anymore. You might call woke art or art with social and political meaning. Yes, it's a financial asset, but people still want to stand in front of a painting and feel like they get it. And I still do. Mm -hmm. Intr feel, feel like they get it. And that's kind of been the running through line. It seems to be. The answer is going to be if we're going to get I one. I think it's. I think. I guess I would say it's more fundamental. Is like people still want to feel something about art, even if they recognize it as like. I mean, I guess right. Like it. It's not on the same level. But if you're like creating a collection of Blu-rays or something, or like you're getting box sets and things like that, like you may recognize. Ah, oh, man, this is a cool thing that I have. This collection that I'm building up. And hey, maybe I might sell a couple of these eventually if I need some money or like you know sell the whole set if I needed, but at the end of the day, I still would like to enjoy whatever it is that I own. Like, people who collect, you know, who have a huge collection of retro games, of course, the collection itself is of value to them, like, the collection itself, rather than the individual game. But, you know, the individual games can still be meaningful to them, but it seems like... As well. I think when she's talking yeah, about getting uh, it... Or go ahead, finish. No, no, go for it. So I think when she's talking about getting it, she's meaning like standing in front of something and having a feeling evoked. I think that's when she says gets it or, or like trying to understand what the other's trying to convey. I think a big problem with this, um, there's a really good TED talk by old piano player guy who was talking about how classical music, the, um, the vocabulary of classical music is kind of lost on modern day people because we just don't listen to a lot of it. And there's a phenomenon that happens where you listen to a piece of classical music and this happens with 99% of people even though they won't admit it. You listen to a piece of classical music and it sounds okay, but you don't really get it. it like, it, it, I guess, like it's not amazing. It just, you hear it and it's eh, whatever. And I think people start to feel bad about it. Like, fuck, I don't, I don't really get this. You know, they're like, there are I... few... Go ahead. Sorry. Because there's people who watch Blade Runner five times before they are. Uh, oh, finally yeah. Understand it. <laughs> like, because it's a film that you're supposed to. Like, there, there's definitely that. Like, I'm saying FOMO. I think FOMO explains a lot of it. Like, I, I don't know right. if it's FOMO. You, it's just more like a, you're watching something that you don't that understand. That one was FOMO. He, he does not want to. He, he was like, oh, so we, we are referencing a specific example oh, okay. uh, with yeah. the Blade Runner one. Yeah, where it's like. Mm -hmm. there's there's a perception of this is of high quality this is like the you know the, this is like a great work of this um medium and if yeah. you look at it and it's like, ah, it doesn't really do anything for me it's kind of like an unacceptable answer for some like you feel like it's an unacceptable answer so you've got to keep watching it and trying to figure out like whether you get it rather than just accepting yeah it's not for me oh, like okay. just being a little bit more confident in your preferences I still think that's applicable to a lot of people as well. Just you don't want to watch them and everyone's enjoying it and having fun and getting all this meaning out of it. And you're like, I didn't get anything. What the fuck? What's going on? What's wrong with me? The conversation. Yeah. It's kind of how this has been framed. This whole video is the, the, the solution to when you don't get it. What is it? It's tricky because there is kind of a cultural pressure with art. Especially modern art. Ah, see? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there it is. There you go. And I know that there are some people who respond to that pressure by just denying that modern art can have meaning. They're like, oh, nobody really gets it. Why nobody did she really have so much it? reverb for this? To. I don't get it. I don't know all... why. It's totally Wait, unnecessary. That's have we decided fun. it's definitely not a part of the just <laughs> room she's in? Or? It's absolutely artificial. You could, really? you could even you could hear the distortion in her voice, too. It's not even well done. Why would you do that? <laughs> was... <laughs> beginning, you know, it's so weird. It's like I've been in rooms before. I know how rooms work. If you're whispering to me and I'm right in front of you, it's not going to echo for the whole all, all around us ambiently. Mm. Oh, it's, they, kind of it's even worse here. Oh, you're it's right. Because if you were talking like this in an art gallery and it echoed like this, how fucking annoying would that be? Like if yeah. you were just sitting there, just, just, just shut the fuck up in this art gallery. Yeah, okay, no one's yeah. Yeah, like, no me. I know how rooms work. You know what? You've convinced me. I do think that this is artificial now, because if it wasn't, my god. What a strange choice, but yeah. I just pretend to. And that's always seemed kind of cynical to me. 
What it, and it, and it applied to somebody else talking in the background too. They didn't. See, so someone someone else is talking. It gets hit with the same reverb effect. Rags. Do you remember that Batwoman episode where they'd applied the Batwoman yes. filter to a voice, and then some random person talked between the saying something, and the filter had applied. To oh, yeah, they didn't yeah. cut out the filter for that other person's voice. <laughs> I do remember that. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to get any more seasons of that show. Oh, you know, we got to save her. We have to enjoy to every it. second we have Great. now. We got to squeeze as much blood from that stone as yeah. we can. We will finish it eventually. But at the we same will. time, I do feel that pressure. Like, I, I feel like I should have opinions about Mark Rothko. I should be that kind of cultured person. But I guess if that's how I'm approaching it, then I'm not really engaging it's, with yeah, it's, I'm it's just it's worried not, about the kind of person that I feel I should be. Like, yeah. oh, what if I get invited to a party and I say the wrong thing about Mount Rothko and I make a fool of myself? But that's, I would, if that, what this party just seems like a really lame way to engage with, uh, with, uh... But is oh, it a it reality? Damn. Well, it's a reality of your own making. Uh, which maybe that's the revelation at the end here. It's like, yeah, I don't I need to do so. Well, she's describing like the FOMO, it. right? The idea that like everybody enjoys some particular piece of art, but you don't get it. And now you feel like you're missing something, right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, we're saying that um, that's that maybe the conclusion of the video at this point is that's yeah. that's what it's all about. It's the, not necessarily that. strictly about FOMO, just that the, it, it says something about you. That's what it all is. So when you go on an art trip to a gallery and you get presented these paintings that just seem like pointless, be bold enough to say, "Yeah, I don't, I don't like it." Fuck yeah! <laughs> I want to, I want to bolden those people. Do I it. Wonder it. I wonder what it means that this painting, this whole blank, this red canvas. Just be brave enough to say, like, ah, and then go walk off and go look at something else that you like more. Open up Twitter. And, and be like, this is a better way to spend my time than an art gallery. I can complain oh, about yeah. Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Silly way to approach it, because even if I got everything there was to get about Rothko, there's thousands of other artists here that would confront me with that same anxiety. If you come to art looking for a stick to beat yourself with, then you're probably going to find it. So maybe we should ask a different question, which is, what is the point of trying to get it. I hope oh. you have a good answer because it seems when I was like a that's child, an easy one to... We studied Macbeth in English class. If you don't know it, it's about a guy who murders the king and steals the throne. And there's a running theme in the play about Is this the dagger I see before me? People say that Macbeth is wearing somebody else's clothes as a metaphor for him stealing the crown. They say that his new title doesn't fit him. It hangs loose about him like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. Macbeth is all about the Wow, drip. racist. And I, being a little wise ass, put up my hand and said, Miss, did Shakespeare really intend to put that in there? And there's two ways of asking that question. The first is, did the actual man, William Shakespeare, actually sit down in 1606 and have the thought, I am going to use a clothing metaphor in my new play? And then I'm going to send a bunch of flirty sonnets to someone and make them wonder whether I'm bisexual. Oh, we haven't done one of them in a while. Yeah, yeah. this is really, is the, the real bangers. There's no we way more. we can know whether he thought that without a time machine and a mind reader. But the second way of asking the question is, do we get more out of the play if we assume that the clothing metaphor is intended? Do we enjoy it more? Does it prompt us to some interesting reflections if we assume that we are meant to notice it? If we just go, nah, that's just a coincidence, uh, don't worry about it, then are we missing Well, out wait. You go it's ahead. not your only other option, because like, ah, it's a coincidence, don't worry about it. It's like, ah, oh, it's a coincidence, let's talk about it though, you know? Yeah, that's I what guess you, we, we usually, it. we usually, end, if we have like an interpretation like that on some movie or whatever, we'll usually be like, ah, this probably wasn't intended, but who cares? It's there. Yeah, if, it, it, we often say if, if we watch something really, really bad and the writer is clearly not talented at writing, and we see something right, like yeah. this, like, oh, that, that might be intentional, but it, it's probably a coincidence. But it, it's, it's still there. The thing's still there. But uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know how much credit to assign to you, but that's a different thing. Out. The philosopher Goldman says that the point of interpreting art 
is to maximize its artistic value. Now, what exactly is artistic value? Well, maybe that's another story for another time. But his point- I... Oh, I feel like it's really important though. This um... is the video for it, you know? I feel like this is not a story for another time. This is it, man. <laughs> Of the, for this video right at the beginning it's like right so here's some definitions if you agree with this we can progress and we can talk about it rather than you don't well <laughs> we, need we need when we're interpreting art we need to maximize its artistic value i'll talk about that not now yeah we'll, we'll do that, that later more. not in this video well, on the meaninglessness of art of but... anyway. <laughs> oh a story for another time well so in this thing i mean with this far so i feel like you can make some conclusions this is like okay for pop philosophy but it's terrible to actually explore the topic in any meaningful way i think yeah i'd be curious so. to ask you know if we if we got a hundred people who watch this and we asked them you know tell me about it what what was said in it i don't know if we'd really get a concise through line of what was pulled from this the vague thing would be it was presenting a couple of perspectives but a lot of them were very quick and um they they presented more things to dig into but they didn't really go any further than uh, the surface, which, you know, I just would have thought if your focus is philosophy, you're going to want to do your best to be boxing it down. And then I suppose there isn't a strict answer to this one, and that's part of the point. But uh, so many things were left unanswered and uncompared. At least so far. Yes. Maybe they'll fit it all in in the last, how long we got? It's like seven minutes? Yeah. Maybe. I think, our, uh, I think our discussion is, is far not more a helpful. competition. Oh. It's not about being right. But then how do we know that Charles is wrong about Pale Fire? Because if he's right, then the poem isn't good. Jo Whoa. Oh. oh. <laughs> uh, ooh. Well, that is, I do not know if that's as weighty as you think it is. I suppose we'll find out. Well, it's how loaded that is, right? That's so a very loaded. Up. Yeah, especially after the sentence before it was, it's not a competition about figuring who's right or wrong, but... If he's wrong, it's not good. It's, it's like, oh, good. that seems consequential. Like, yeah, throwing the word like good into this video well, is a nightmare. Yeah. Well, well, I don't think we've had the word good at all. Like, any, like, good or bad. We've only ever had correct or incorrect readings of it. Yeah. But yeah, like, good. Whoa, what does that mean when we're talking about the meaning of art, fundamentally? John Shade leaves behind this amazing work. He writes about being an old man at the end of his life and what it was like to lose his daughter, and it's really, really moving. If we assume, as Charles does, that oh, well, that stuff doesn't matter, it's really all about him, well then, it's kind of a waste. Oh, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm really sorry is that it? that's how you view these things. That must be awful. This character is philosophy tube now, right? It's not like um. I think so. I think, I think this, this is, is yeah, a perspective the creator, on, yeah. Uh, on this. Because, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's dodgy to be like, the interpretation is worse if uh, if it's to be taken this direction versus this direction. Especially if you or consider even if it's, valid. I, it, it almost seems like if it isn't, like, if you know the answer, then it's a waste. Okay, wait, can you back up like yeah, 35, yeah. back up like 35 seconds and play this whole segment so I can hear this. Yeah, this is... A competition. It's not about being right. But then how do we know that Charles is wrong about Pale Fire? Because if he's right, then the poem isn't good. John Shade leaves behind this amazing work. He writes about being an old man at the end of his life and what it was like to lose his daughter. And it's really, really moving. If we assume, as Charles does, that oh, well, that stuff doesn't matter, it's really all about him, well then, it's kind of a waste. That's what makes Charles a tragic character. He's so lost in his own mess that he can't see the true value of what John has made. As for me... Mm. Well, so I don't, I don't see how that answer changes anything. Like the, like how do we, cause, cause the claim was if the author's perspective on what the story is about is correct, then it's not good. It's like, that doesn't, that doesn't change anything about what is in the story, though. Like the story uh, with these characters, or that like, which even said about. On... I think it would. I think it just. I think it feels like one of those things where it's like I could be wrong because I don't remember now because um, it was a long time ago. And this video was brought up, or when we've listened to it. But like, um, 
it's it's almost like if you make it to the end of a story or whatever, or maybe you finish a story and then the author says like, oh yeah, that story it was all a dream, and that's why it was the way it was. You can kind of feel like it cheapens it, or it's like, oh well, if that's the case, this is dog shit, or like this isn't interesting anymore. Or if well, Nolan actually came out and he said like, oh yeah, when that spinning top wobbled, um, we ran out of money to film the last five seconds, but it falls over. Like yeah, he's in the real world. Like if that's the case, oh. Well, that's actually kind of shitty. That's actually not that cool. Or do you remember actually at the end of Shutter Island? Do you remember the quote that Leonardo DiCaprio says to um, the other guy? Did anybody watch the movie? Exactly what he said. He says like, "Is I it better? Can't. Is it better to die a good man or to live a monster?" Imagine yeah. if the guy comes out and he says, "Oh, if you look really early at the beginning, um, he actually just sees that quote in a book or whatever, and he just like says it because his character's just kind of like wandering it. But he's actually crazy again. Oh, well, okay. Well, that makes the ending really dog shit if that's actually oh, the case, I, I, right?" But I guess the thing is, you can always just disagree with that and say, like, well, I think, because it's not... Sure, you could. Either. You could disagree with that and try to draw other meaning out of it. But, like, if it's true and if you take that to be the case, and, oh, well, it does kind of cheap out. I think which is... Yeah, answer. but I guess that's the thing is, you don't have to take it to be the case because it is beyond the material. Like, if he says, well, it fell over, it's like, I didn't see that. Like, you said that, but I didn't see that in the film, so... Yeah, sure, but I, I mean, I, she'd probably I, agree you could read it differently, but, like, if it was the case that that was true and then you believed it, that would kind of cheapen the thing. It sounds like that's kind of um, what she's saying. Sure. Is it not but, cheap but, but, at framing, though? I don't understand like how we can define one interpretation as just better than the other one. Are we going with like it's more detailed or deeper? It sounds like deeper? I don't remember the beginning of the what this was explaining, but it almost sounds like let's say that I let's say that my child dies and I write like a very touching story about the death of my child and all the parents and everybody reads it and even people that don't have children relate to it. Like wow, this is so beautiful. And then later on, I come out and I say like holy shit, uh, this was actually just about a, a game of League of Legends where I fed super hard and I like all the things are an analogy for the different stages of a League of Legends game that I lose. Well, somebody might look back at the story of that and be like, oh, fuck. Well, this is like fucking dog shit now. Hold on. I didn't know this was an allegory for a fucking game of League. I thought this was like a beautiful story. It sounds like that's the argument that she's kind of making. Well, we should tie it back to the statement which preceded it, though, which is it's not a competition about who's right. And then, and then the response was, but what about if this interpretation then? Like, what if we don't fight about it? And then she says, well, then it's not good. It's like, oh... So there is a reason to fight for like what you believe to be the correct reading of a story then. Well, sure, but that's kind of what the whole video is exploring, right? What is meaning or what is the correct way to interpret well, things? And it's like, should I, we go by this or that? If the claim is it's not a competition, but you should, but like, it's not about who's right. But if, if this is uh, the conclusion we come to, then it's not good. It's like, so it is about like trying to ascertain some truth, I guess, or at the very least, like, fight to nudge interpretations of stories in a direction that we want. So there is a point to having these discussions and fighting about whether you think you're right or wrong. Well, I mean, I imagine there's some point. She made a video on it, right? It's a 40 minute video. <laughs> I mean, I imagine she thinks there's some point to explain it. Well, sure, that, that's the case, but like, what is the conclusion that we've seemed to arrive at here? Like, and I was gonna say, do you really feel like everything we've seen so far supports that position? Because I don't. Supports which position? The position that there are interpretations that are superior to others. Um, I don't know if she's given a conclusion on it yet. It seems like so far she's been exploring all of these. You just things said too. it. You yeah, said that if made the statement. It's an interpretation, then the story isn't good. Therefore, the other interpretation. This, means this is like the whole yeah, issue was, we're taking. Yeah, it's it's weird was to hear from Philosophy Tube that there could be two people with interpretations of a story, and that one of them is just better than the other. Yeah. Yeah, I might be misinterpreting, but it, it still sounds like it's all like an exploration of different ways of looking at it. I don't know if she's given like, this is the answer. I don't think she but, will yeah, give different that answer, ways, but... one being wrong, do you, do you believe wrong. That, do you believe that on this statement where she says, if this interpretation is correct, the book isn't good, that that isn't like her perspective on, on that story? Like her definitive mm. perspective on that story? I mean, it sounds like she's saying that like, if there was a different interpretation, it, that interpretation makes it sound far more hollow, shallow, and less meaningful oh, than the interpretation. Not that it doesn't, it's wrong and it has it no make word. It sound it's that a it, waste. That, it's, it, that it is less good. It is not as, it's not good, is what she yeah. said. Yeah, the so I think that's- Well, it sounds like it's not, if it, if it was a story just about himself, as opposed to like the meaningful, touching story of his grandfather dying, then it sounds like that's, one is like way more self-aggrandizing and not as interesting, whereas the other one seems yeah. way more interesting. So I think- That's totally fine as like a perspective that she's yeah. sharing, but it's more so that's that I thought, that, I thought we just said that we're not meant to be fighting about like which perspective is correct or not. Oh. And I also thought that the conclusion that we were drawing from this is that it's actually incredibly difficult to like ascertain the meaning of anything when it comes to the, like this art. And how do we factor in what somebody intended versus how it makes us feel personally? Like, should we? It seems incongruent with the whole tone of this um this video so far to make any definitive statements on like the quality of any given story. Yeah, that's what I mean. This okay. was a plot twist. I, mean, I never expected her to say this. <laughs> exactly. This is uh, an unexpected statement. 
given everything that's been in the video so far. Okay. Yeah, these are very very strongly worded uh, that that it's that the that it's that it's bad that it's a waste. Especially after after talking about how emotional it's well, yeah, it's a waste. Was. What does that mean? That a story yeah. is a waste. I, like I, based on everything we've talked about so far, that seems like a conclusion that you wouldn't. That a story can be a waste if the author's interpretation is correct. Even though we're not meant to be fighting about whether or not any of these perspectives are right or wrong. But you think that if you're right, that it's a waste. Like, hmm. It's a very definitive statement to make, given that this whole video has been like about not really coming to any sound, to strong conclusions on any given, you know, argument. And that's why I was looking to clarify to make sure this wasn't a character again. I'm pretty sure this is conclusion time. Like, this is philosophy tube. Rather than, um, exactly. you know, a, a, P a POV character. And Rothko, I can try to put together all the different ideas that we've looked at today. I can bear in mind what Susan Sontag said about not intellectualizing things too much. I can remember that the process by which art gets exhibited is often a financial thing rather than an arbiter of its meaning, so I don't have to feel pressured by that. And I can also try to think about what Rothko himself might have intended or felt. Not so I. But that's not even a really good explanation for the the art gallery thing. Like it can be for this reason, so I shouldn't care about it. It's like no, there there are other reasons that we talked about the whole the pre the pressure thing. Like. It's weird that you, in your recap of that, went with the the, the, the cynical art zombie stuff instead of the more you know the more personal feelings that had, not to be pressured. Or being pressured in into certain way, yeah. And stuff or, it's yeah. An odd way to recap all, that whole point, but yeah. I can reconstruct his brain, but so I can see whether I can also feel those things. I'm looking for new experiences when I go to his art. I'm trying to grow and develop as a person rather than trying to get it. Seems like a... Wait, wait, wait. So you're not... How are these two distinct things? Is that not well, part of what getting it is? Is learning the interpretations of a piece? And... Does this answer the, the question or even come close to being like the question, is art meaningless? That statement just there about like, I'm, I'm not, it's not about, I'm not trying to intellectualize it. I'm just going to experience it. It's like, what does that have to do with whether it has meaning or not? I thought that was the, why we're here. Presumably, does art have a meaning? that is art's meaning to experience art's it. Meaning is to experience. So that's the art's answer. Meaning art's is meaning to is to experience it. Art's meaning is to experience it. I can believe I mean, that's the point the part of at least part of the point she wants to i mean you know she kind of summarized that like a lot of this all these different metrics have loads of issues that mm -hmm. poke holes in them to the point of throw it not necessarily throw it all out maybe even keep it all in and maybe thus... there are parts of each one that have something you know valuable to offer or just like prisms i guess as i've been writing my play I've had to deal with a lot of these questions and be in the room with actors as they try to interpret the characters that I have written. By the time you're watching this, rehearsals will already have started. I know that a lot of you already have tickets and I cannot wait to share the prince with you. I am so, so excited. It is a dream come true to be able to make art. And I, I, I just want to say this thank video. you to all of you, basically, because without Philosophy Tube, I'd never have been able to do this. And I also wanted to make sure that even if you can't come to London and see it live, you can still experience it. So there's a streaming service called Nebula where you'll be able to oh, watch wait, a is professional this, wait, wait, recording. It sounds like we're going into an ad. I was actually about to say, I don't know if the video edited or not. I guess we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. We'll give her a chance. So wonder, All right. I was wondering, in order to... So, so would she want us to know how she intends for the art to be uh, interpreted or to know the in her intentions of the play would, would you know is that something we well, should yeah, know we, was, we should it was mentioned at one point in the video right uh, um it was going to be about the royal family but it ended up being about something else so should we right, so that would be an interesting question to ask her is like do you think that i should factor in anything you said in this video about your play like while i think about your play? i think she would say factor in whatever the hell you want yeah, that's well, what I think. She, this, this whole video yeah. sounds more like an exploratory, like, here are things to think about than anything else. Of the play. Unlike YouTube, Nebula doesn't have ads or uh, algorithms yeah. or demonetization. Yeah. <laughs> it's owned by the Good creators old Nebula. who work on it, like me. 
So it's a place where we can put the experimental, unusual stuff that wouldn't Wait, work so that, that's here the on end, YouTube, then. like no my play, and also like the behind-the-scenes the documentary yeah, that the Philosophy Tube crew made thing. last year about how this show comes together. Fans of Philosophy Tube can get a special deal on Nebula. If you sign up to Curiosity good philosophy Stream using my special link, curiositystream.com. Like I said, I think it, all of our stuff is kind of pop philosophy, that's what she does. Well, so I was going to say, I think it even year, suffers of being pop philosophy. Not a month. Well, that's kind of how pop philosophy year, works. It always does suffer. <laughs> and well, do you think it could be done well, or at least better? Well, I don't know. A lot of philosophy people on YouTube and in the world argue that. That's why people don't like, that's why scientists well, don't like pop scientists. And pop scientists don't like normal scientists because they're dog shit communicators. Which is true. Normal scientists are dog shit communicators. So. Do you, well, I would say that this video has not been the greatest example of communicating your thoughts and ideas. Uh, no. Let us... effectively. Uh, Sure, the problem with pop stuff is it's usually like, it sacrifices a lot of intellectual integrity for um, curiosity or entertainment. So I would say that this purpose accomplishes its goals insofar as it's entertaining, and maybe it'll provoke some people to dig further, hopefully. But I mean, like, if you come away from this thing, you've got a good understanding of meaning and art, probably not a good thing. Well, because that's the thing. I'd be curious to poll your audience as to the, what if they could write a paragraph would be what they concluded from the video. I'd be interested to see what uh, kind of answers you get. And everything on curiosity stream including this little documentary about what happened to picasso's estate after he died it's a fascinating mm. little insight into the finances of the art world considering that you can get both nebula and curiosity stream for a year for like less than what netflix costs a month i think that's a pretty sweet deal and you'll also be helping me bring my dream to life on a professional london stage so go to curiositystream.com slash philosophy tube and sign up for the bundle today and I will see you very, very soon at the theater. Okay, no, sad, that's yeah. it. Right. Oh, that okay. was the end. Oh. All right. Good job. Well, well <laughs> that was a bad video. Um yeah, I mean I just I, I don't know. It, it, uh, I think that my biggest issue would just be throwing a, a few too many words in without defining them uh it yeah the, things... the bomb at the end about something being a waste and not good is like whoa that's like you can't just drop that without an explanation like a thing's bad if it it doesn't match a particular interpretation or well i still or, feel like the, the reason why is because the other works. interpretation was going to be dog shit right that like without the context of it this is what it's really about is like his relationship with his grandfather it just whatever it was if, if you interpret it the other way it just becomes like this incoherent schizo rambling bullshit that doesn't really have as much meaning well, it was um, the, the the guy who was interpreting that the poems were about him and that the guy was possibly in love with him or whatever. I, I thought it was the one surely, with the, the relationship with his grandfather or something is how it was being interpreted. Well, uh, whichever the... When you have two interpretations, because like my concern, I thought uh, we were sort of on the same page with this, was that as long as the references match, it's like valid and how interesting it's going to be at that point i just i find that really difficult to like put on a scale uh, if we're going to just be like i don't know is star wars more interesting than lord of the rings it's like uh i don't know maybe how how are we ranking these and if you want to be like yeah but we can tell when it's you know what's more interesting a i don't know a ball rolling down a hill versus star wars like star wars obviously right and it's like I, it would go on by like the individual and then uh I don't know. Like, it, it just feels really weird to say that one interpretation is just definitively better because it's more interesting. Well, I guess, like, um, well, what? I, so did you guys, we all, everyone in here liked that Everything Ever All at Once movie, right? Yeah. Yes. If you come away from that movie and you are like, it was, it was kind of like an okay superhero movie, I would say you have a dog shit interpretation of the movie, right? You kind of missed the whole point, <laughs> right? Now, that is a valid interpretation. Not only is it a valid interpretation, a direct reading of the movie actually gives you that. That's what it is. It's a, kind of like a superhero multiverse movie. But like if that if you walk away and that's your ultimate interpretation, man, what a waste of that. But if, well, you, so right? that's if kind someone... of the point though is um that I guess is like we would fight over what people say about movies. It seems like the conclusion that we've drawn here at the end of the video though is that like anything can be anything, you know. Was it? I thought that like, was I thought there were well, a lot of different things presented that like either anything and anything or like the author's intent is important or intellectualizing things are bad. I don't think this again. I could be wrong, but I don't think the video went on to make strong statements about how you should interpret things, just that there are like a ton of different ways, theoretically, that you could interpret things. Strongest part was where she said that there's some interpretations that are just good and some are bad. Well, I don't um, think it was that so some are bad. I think it was in reference to that particular piece of media. 
It sounded like that particular that piece of gonna, meaning was really weird. You're going to use you, that. At, surely, if you you agree that if you're going to declare that one interpretation of even a singular piece of media is good by comparison to another, then that opens up the floodgates. There is good and bad ways to interpret media. Well, I mean, I yeah, think anybody everything. would agree there's probably good and bad ways to interpret media, even Ex No, I, I completely mm -hmm. agree. She mm -hmm. did that at the end and didn't elaborate. Yeah, there was in a video called "Is Art Meaningless?" That's absurd. Yeah, you just drop that at the end, and that's the the video's over. And I feel like no, you've just this opened the, this up. Well, this maybe is that's part of like, your interpretation. Actually, maybe she was doing all of this just to provoke thought in you. <laughs> well, that's my that, that's, how meta. That's... This is the Rothko painting of a video. There you go. Or maybe it was maybe the maybe capitalist that's... version. She just did this because she knew it would make the most money. Hmm. Um, that's probably true to some degree. Because yeah, if a lot of people can interpret their own conclusions, then it's going to be better than if you told them too many things. In stone. Well, yeah, um, you, you've given everybody something to uh, where they maybe. can walk away like I learned something. It, whereas you didn't make any like real definitive statements, and so it's the least defensive thing ever because you didn't say anybody was wrong except right at the end when you said that that interpretation was bad or like that it's worse than the other one. Yeah, just to just to clarify, if you pulled apart your own statement about that person having a dog shit interpretation of everything ever all at once, if they said, "What do you mean by that?" That like like objectively, I do, you'd be like. No, I just think that my point of view of the film and what it's about is way more interesting than yours. And then they go, to you? And then you'd be like, yeah. And then they go, oh, well, I don't care. I think what and I would say like, is well, there is a plethora of media to choose from that would give you that interpretation. And that if you are going into a movie like that, and that's what you're walking out with, you've wasted your time watching that movie. There are a lot of other movies made for people like you that you could appreciate probably more. Because as a superhero movie, it kind of sucked. There are way better superhero movies. If you're only watching a superhero movie, you're missing like 95% of the subtext of the film. Or, or, or the, the actual text of the film. I think it does better as a superhero movie than a lot of the stuff that comes out these days as well. If Even on that track. But... I, I understand what you're saying. I mean, in terms of, like, um, if I just want to watch, like, epic superhero shit, I'm not getting, yeah. like, yeah, it's a way different type of experience, right? Um, yeah, that's that's why I would say that, like, if, if that's your interpretation of the movie, then, like, damn, what a waste of, like, you just, you, they're way well, better things I guess, to watch. But, like, that wasn't, that kind of wasn't, like, we didn't really talk about that much in terms of, like, thinking about what it is that you want to get out of something. Like we focus on, do I get it? It's like, but what about? Well, what that's do the you same question. Get out of it personally. Yeah, I think that's the same um, question. Is like, do I get it? What am I getting out of this? Like, what, am I understanding it? Am I engaging with it in the way that it's meant to be or supposed right. to be? Right. Yeah, actually, yeah, true. All right then. Um, Is it all right? <laughs> no, if you want fail. To, if you want to, if you want to get out of here, I, I don't blame you. Okay, if you want to. Okay, look, I made it the whole way this time. Game. Are you proud of me? You actually did. Well, we do super chats next, but um, we well, usually offer that the guests can, can jump out. Wait, what? Fuck you, I said. But I love you. Okay. Well, hey, thanks for having me on. It's been fun. Stay safe. Be careful, guys. You yeah, too. you bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good luck you whatever too, it is you get up to next in life. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> be careful, bids. Bye-bye. Toodaloo. See you. Bye-bye-bye. See you later. Toodles. We survived a whole EFAP thing, guys. Are you proud of me?